I just wait a second yeah. that I see the disconnect. It's just you two, so I have When we see us, I can close and then I press the opportunity. And then uh, each one of you. What should I say? And if it doesn't work, you have just to pick on the side. Eventually, the presentation of the uh, and we are actually and we are unmuted. I got two presentations. Okay. So they are actually. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to those people online who've joined us. Welcome. And of course, a very special welcome to Tranta and Stephanie for joining us and for coming out for this very fancy celebration. Um, a 60th birthday, which is tomorrow. So Sue, in, in advance, happy birthday for tomorrow. Thank you for the lunch that we've had. Are we getting lunch tomorrow again? On Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. And this is a fantastic opportunity. Not only are we celebrating Sue's birthday um, and her wonderful career in productivity and not only are we celebrating the students' careers and their wonderful productivity, we really are wanting to encourage more of these kinds of gatherings, more sharing, more distribution of the research that we're doing, more marketing of ourselves, because that's the way we're going to build the school uh, going forward. So 
Welcome to the talks. Um, unfortunately, there's had to be a slight change in the program. Uh, David Koza from the Council for Geoscience, many of you know him and some of you work with him, um, is unable to attend today. Something else very urgent has cropped up, so he's not going to be able to attend. But Ray and, and, and Kenneth, Thank you very much for stepping in um, to fill in that time. So well done to you on such short notice, but thank you for that. And I wish you all the best of luck today. Good luck for all of you who are presenting over the next couple of days. And uh, thank you, Sue, for spearheading this and let's do it more often. Let's make sure that we continue this, this tradition and, and build a tradition of sharing and caring. I unfortunately can't stay because I've got a staffing and promotions committee meeting and some of our own staff members are up for probation and for promotion, so I need to be at that meeting, but do enjoy it. Um, and I look forward to some great reports coming out of today. So well done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sue. And again, happy birthday. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, then they can't see me on them. Race, you are the next speaker. We're talking. Okay, awesome. Again. Um, thanks to the head of school for a nice introduction. We celebrating a good friend of mine. We will do it in an African way first before we start the talks because in South Africa we see it is a bit. But we we'll just have to bear with us, especially our international colleagues. It's good to have you. But we'll just sing a happy birthday song to. I don't like this guitar. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday song to Sue. And if you can stand, you stand. If you can sit down, you sit down. But I think it would be nice if you stand, those who can stand. So let's stand up and sing Happy Birthday to our wonderful colleagues, Professor Susan Ward. Okay. Because I Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Sue. And thank you for being a wonderful colleague, friend. Just a quick one. I'm a geophysicist today because of Sue. So that's a trick. So it's Sue's first time. Well, thank you, Sue, for all your contributions. Before we start with the first talk, for all that you've done for, for South Africans from skills development, science teaching, human capacity building, and I'm sure many students and many colleagues have graduated, like the one who, had, who could not be here, Dr. David Koza, was a Sue student at some, at some stage, and many others were online, so we're so thankful to have worked with Sue. Sue, you should look back and be proud of all that you have achieved individually and also through the collaboration with so many colleagues. And the testimony to that is that we have people who've traveled all the way from Norway and many other places around me who are here today to celebrate, so it just demonstrates how important you are, not just to us in South Africa, but to many others uh, international as well. Well done, Sue, and thank you. Straight to it, uh, we have a first session which is cluster geosciences. Uh, basically, we had our first speaker who happened to put out because of our, our external reasons, but really just an hour before I came here, he agreed to step in to talk about, which I think is really fitting to talk about Africa Array because Sue has been up pushing Africa Array program for as long as I've lived, I think. So it's just a good demonstration of what Sue has contributed about the work that has been done in Africa. Ray, give us an overview about the Africa Ray. Ray is a professor in School of Geosciences. He is the part of the Community of Practice Program, which is which deals with the skills development and um and training in oil and gas in South Africa. 
also is the co-chair of the Africa Ray Skills Development Program and many, many other things that if I start talking about on spending it. Thanks to you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And Sue, it's wonderful to be here and celebrate with you. And uh, of course, our careers have running parallel a long time. I was in South here from 83 to 93. And after I left, you came and more or less filled that, that vacant position. So yeah, we've done uh, lots of things together over the years. So here I'll be talking about Africa Array Program and and you'll give you an idea of what we do. But this was founded in 2005, more or less, and Sue was here and very involved in the arrangements for this, the launch of this organization. And this is the last time, excuse me, that we had a face-to-face -face meeting here in Johannesburg at Fitz. And generally, we get our associates from the rest of Africa, more than about 40 people from many other countries in sub saharan Our colleagues here, and of course, our South African team, and we'd be about... 80 people gathering here for a workshop, two days of scientific meetings, and also training programs as well. And you can see on the your left-hand side, extreme left, is Sue over there, being a real stalwart of this. But why was Africa Ray founded? It was about developing human and institutional capacity, not just in South Africa, but really in the whole of Africa. And also to build the competence and infrastructure to con conduct research directed towards natural resources, of course, oil, gas, minerals, metals, geohazards, and sheer curiosity, looking at how the earth works. Uh, right, and of course, an important part of this that also carries the Africa Array brand is the Africa Array International Geophysics Field School, of which Sue's been the director all along and the real driving force. And in this article from October 2015, you can see colored in red. I know the British have this ambition to color the map of Africa red from Cape to Cairo. And Sue has a similar ambition. And those are all the countries at that stage on which students had come to attend uh, Africa Ray training courses. And that continues. Right, but what are we doing in Africa Ray? Well, we're looking at the deep structure of the African continent. How did it evolve? And what are the implications for resources and geohazards? And there are many fantastic things that we can research here, like kimberlites, hotspots, booms, supervolcanoes, the East African Rift, the large low shear wave velocity provinces, so many of these. And I'm just gonna to touch on some of the work that's been done and published over the last five or so years to bring you up to date. But really what is our toolbox? Well, it's fundamentally, we use a lot of seismic tools, broadband seismology from which there are a whole range of methods that we can use to extract images of the Earth's subsurface, also reflection seismics, and then the other tools of geophysics, gravity, magnetics, and magnetotellurics. And of course, I guess this is a geophysics talk, I should add here, what's well, all about geology, really, you know, and that's what we need, we really try to find out about. But taking us back pre-Africa Ray, there was a program over here called the South African Seismic Experiment, and Sue was very involved with that. In fact, I guess you were helped run the base here at WITS, where 83 stations, seismic broadband seismic stations were deployed from the Cape all the way into Zimbabwe. And they were deployed for a period of about two years. And this was the, 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 the very first really of this large scale uh, moving arrays that were done. Since then, bigger experiments have been done in the US and in Europe and in Australia, but this really was a precursor. And the partners here were people such as the MIT and the Carnegie Institute of Washington. And what was the end result over there was of course, looking at not only the, we know the topography of South Africa, there's this mystery, why are we so highly elevated? We've got these kimberlite pipes, which bring us hand specimens from rock samples from the lower mantle and the, uh, sorry, the upper mantle and the lower crust. But we were able to, with our seismic techniques, to map the moho, map the roots of the continent. And what we have done, and I suppose just a few years ago, uh, Branko Corner and I, an ex-colleague who was here at Witz, old friend, um, we would, uh, compiled all the data we could find, geological and, and geophysical in, uh, information you can see in Southern Africa, the baseline data, all those diamond shapes running through uh, Southern Africa are, are broadband seismic stations. And also you see those other profiles running across here. These are magnetotelluric profiles that were done under the auspices of SAMTEX. And that was a, a magnetotelluric experiment that Sue was very with as well. And of course, a gravity and magnetic data and over here, we attempted to pull it together as best we could. But let's, let's move here. Well, here we've got this backbone network of about 50 stations um, spread through uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And here we work with many um, 
departments of mines, geological surveys, and universities to keep these stations running. And many of them have been running for, um, well, I guess since about 2006, 2007, continuously recorded. And at about half the stations, we've installed GPS stations, so we can look at plate motions, and we can also look at other interesting phenomena like space weather. And, um, and we also have weather stations there as well, look at things like which is what we call our backbone network. But then over the last 15 years, we've done many 10 or 20 or maybe even 30 sites among us, and where we get fun. For example, the drifting of the East African Rift, and we'll set them out and deploy them there for anywhere between 18 months and maybe three or four years to um, do detailed studies at a particular at a particular issue. And our most recent array, you can see around the bushwell complex going from the Botswana border to more or less the Kruger Park, are those red inverted triangles. And that's been our so called Bushveld array. We're for about four years in the end. And we are busy working up that data right now. So, what does a typical station look like? Well, our backbone stations, we go to more trouble there. We, in this case, it's in uh, Malawi, a shaft to get close to bedrock, become the plinth, and that's where your seismometer is installed. And on the right hand side, you see some of the curves looking at the shift, these are the GPS data, looking at the movement of the station. Now, on the top two on the right show the general northeasterly drift of the continent. And very interestingly, down below, you see the vertical motion where we have got an annual signal where it goes up and down. And this is something Sikalela Gorma over here did for his MSC was to look and try to understand how much what is the down is it? But Sikalela, how much does it go up and down by? Five centimeters, yeah. So you can see the scale is uh, that, uh, that, that scale over here is millimeters, so it's 50 millimeters. Five centimeters. That's about the up and down. The double amplitude would be about five centimeters. It varies from station to station, and we were trying to understand what that, what's that due to? Is it the atmosphere? Is it the temperature of the station? Is it the Earth? Interesting little problem. Also, going out to set up some of our temporary arrays. This is just one of our field parties where we set up our Namibia array. And you can see on the left hand side some of the people who worked there. Second from the left is uh, Ranto Revelison, who was our program uh, manager for a while, and Third from the right is Jonathan Seca, who spent a, a sabbatical here, and he's now leading the, one of the leaders of what is called the European Plate Observing System, and where we are trying to set up better collaboration between Europe and Africa and Latin America, but that's sticking out in the station. But this is again, just focusing on Southern Africa. We work together with colleagues, particularly at Penn State University, at the University of Twente in the Netherlands, to look at the deep structure of Southern Africa some of the papers that we published, but why are we interested in this? And this again ties in with one of Sue and Tom's passions over here to do kimberlites. Of course, this, uh, some of this work was sponsored by the diamond mining companies because they want to know what are the most prospective areas because we're looking for parts of our example, which are, are you could say cold uh, and high pressure because we, there's a better chance that kimberlites that have uh, originated from that region will have diamonds in them. So that is one of the driving reasons from an economic point of view for doing this type of work. Right, and again, this is just a, a lot of detail. I won't go into it at all right now, but we're trying to understand what is the difference between the different terrains in Southern Africa. So you end up with a data cube, a velocity tomogram that you can dice it and slice it any way you like to look at differences between the different regions. On the left-hand side, there's just a, a slice through the earth at a depth of about 200 kilometers. And what is colored there, I'll show you, is your shear wave velocity, more or less at that depth, where the reddish colors are the slow velocities and the blue colors are the higher velocities. And that's because all other things being equal, if the chemistry is the same, what changes the velocity of these seismic waves is the temperature. The warmer it is, the slower the waves. Of course, you have to distinguish between what is causing the variation. And then the second uh, graph, or the central graph over there, just shows Velocity, the change in seismic velocity with depth from surface, you can see the strong change around the moho, and then going into the upper mantle down to perhaps three or 300 kilometers or so. Of course, just to the naked eye, they look very similar, but on the right hand side, what is interesting is when you subtract one curve from the other, and that highlights the contrasts between the different terrains. 
but generally below 250 kilometers, there's very little difference in velocities between the on craton and off craton velocities. But, but at shallower depths, there we start to see some very significant uh, differences, which we try to interpret either in terms of temperature or chemistry or mineral. But one of the important things we're trying to understand over here is what has caused our Southern Africa to bob up over the last between five and 30 million years ago. What has caused this buoyancy? And really, we don't see evidence for that lying in the uppermost mantle. Uh, uh, it, it should be something happening deeper down in the mid to lower mantle. But just to take you to another example of something that we've been looking at is the Congo base, huge base inside Africa, very difficult to do field work there because of the infrastructure is not so good. But if you use a technique such as shear wave tomography, you're able to work out what's going on inside that region by surrounding it with seismic sources and seismic receivers. So on the right-hand side, you see a map of Africa. And all those white triangles you see, there are seismic stations that we've been operating, many by Africa Ray and others by other agencies as well. But in places such as Cameroon, Central Africa, Southern Africa, and Ethiopia. And all the other dots, the blue uh, symbols, indicate earthquakes that have been recorded. So if you draw a line from each earthquake source to each station where it was recorded, you get that particular ray path. And you can see it forms a very dense network of ray paths over Central Africa, over the Congo Basin. And we're able to combine all that information and do a tomographic reconstruction. And this is much like happens to you when you get stuck in and have a CAT scan done for you at a hospital and they shoot x-rays at you from all sorts of angles and see how well they've been attenuated. And from that, they can come with an incredibly detailed picture of the human body. Well, this is what we're trying to do with the Earth. And we've come up, again, with an image of the seismic velocity that uh, it changed with depth. Here, we're not looking so deep. We're looking at about the 10 or 12 kilometers of the Earth's crust. And what we did over here, just to make it a little bit more interesting, is we jointly interpreted this data with the satellite gravity field. So we had to find a solution to both the gravity and the seismics. And this work was primarily done by Ronto, but what we were able to show over there is in the center of this Congo Basin, in fact, it's not just one simple basin, but there's a ridge in the center. And um, which is important because if you're trying to prospect in that region for hydrocarbons, you might think naively that the deepest part of the basin is in the center, but of course, this is not the case over here. So this is the type of work that was done, finding that there are about two sub-basins that are deep, about eight kilometers deep. And what causes the structure would be all sorts of arguments, could be sort of tectonics or horse block, but we felt that was most likely due here to salt tectonics, that you have a salt layer that formed there and it became unstable and formed some sort of diapeel. But let's get on to other uses. We've spoken a bit a little about looking at the fundamental structure of the continent, a little bit how it evolved, how it can be used to look for natural resources on a broad scale, whether they be diamonds or oil and gas. But of course, when we collect all this data, one of the big uh, I suppose threats facing people along the East African Rift is um, okay. We have any... Yeah, I forgot to share the screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's, um, right. Sorry about that. No problem. I have to skip my yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, we still got that in the side. You can minimize that. I don't minimize it. It's up, up the left there. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, but of course, while we're recording all these earthquakes from all around the world, and also regionally and locally, we can study what is the seismic activity uh, in the region. And especially along the East African Rift, every year there's an earthquake bigger than magnitude set, six, every generation, one bigger than seven. And of course, sooner or later, one of those is going to happen close to a city. And there are big cities in that region, Nairobi and Sababa, others that we, you don't hear about, but have a million people like Bukavu in the DRC. And one of those that days that's going to happen close to a city within 10 kilometers of this construction there is not earthquake resistant. And we could have a, a major human disaster, a bit like we've seen in Turkey. Of course, construction is not very good. 
And so as part of a USAID funded project, we work together with the Global Earthquake Model Program to combine our Africa array data that we've collected with other data that has been collected over decades all over Africa to come up with a seismic hazard model for the whole East African rift system. And so again, I won't go into the details here, but one gathers all the data, you homogenize it to make sure you're dealing with the same uh, type of magnitude scale, you divide it into regions where you feel the region, you've got a pretty much similar driver of your seismicity and each region you try to work out what is your relationship between your frequency of earthquakes and size. So you try to get these basic seismic hazard parameters sorted out. And also finding out how deep do those earthquakes occur, the shallow, the mid crust or deep crust because all this is important information. And so we were able then to update and uh, uh, come up with a new model of seismic hazard. And this is just part of the global seismic uh, uh, earthquake model. And the difference about this approach over here is that it's not just a, something that's printed for once on a piece of paper. It is source. You can it's continually update it, and all the tools can be used by any worker who wants to add more data, try different algorithms, and refine their work in a particular area. But this was part of the contribution that we as Africa Array and African geoscientists made to the, the global seismic as an assessment program. And then we, of course, continue to do similar work on specific projects over here, looking at various regions. And over the years, we've had a good uh, contact with Madagascar. And I know Lou and Sue, you've been there, haven't you? have done work there as well. And um, what we have done, working with, again, the National, uh, the NSF, the National Science Foundation, have been a major funder of the Backbone Network and some of these programs that we deploy, a network of seismographs, Madagascar, and there's some curious things there. It is far from a plate boundary, the Indian Ocean Ridge or the East African Rift, but there are volcanoes that have been recently active. How does that happen? Is one of the key questions we we're trying to understand. And also, what is the seismic hazard one in um, Madagascar? So one of our PhD students, Titsi, uh, part of her work was to look at the seismic tectonics of Madagascar and understand that you can see those beach balls as we call them on the right hand picture. That gives us an indication of what are the fault mechanisms of these normal faults, strike slip faults, or reverse faults, or a mixture of those. And of course, another thing we were looking at, there have been postulations that there's Africa, the whole African plate is cracking up into subplates, into Nubian plate, the Somalian plate, the sand plate, and other microplates, and that there could be a plate boundary running, in fact, through Madagascar. And so we were checking out whether there's any evidence to support a discrete sharp plate boundary. And another thing that one of our Madagascan students, Fenitra, who's a postdoc here at Vitz, trying to get his visa to allow himself to return to South Africa after his marriage there. But anyway, hopefully he'll be back soon. But he's taking, been taking the distant earthquakes, so we call them seismic earthquakes that happened at distances of 5,000 to 12,000 kilometers away. And they were the way uh, the rays from deep below the earth. And as they come up through the upper mantle of the crust, you find that. The shear wave part gets split like a polarizer does, like the, in your sunglasses, so into a fast and slow direction. And now, by studying the direction of polarization, you're able to tell something again about Earth process. So, the Nitro has been taking the old data, new data, working hard to try to map and identify this polarization that is formed, this fabric. And the question is is it in the trust? Is it in the upper mantle? Is it related to the present day motion of the continent? Or is it a fossil and ancient uh, fabric that has been frozen in? And so this is the type of work that we have been looking. And you can see in this case, the conclusion was that these stations that we analyzed here really corroborated the evidence for sub lithospheric mantle flow beneath, beneath East Africa. Right, let me move on. And what he's doing now, this is a paper that's in review right now. He's been taking uh, seismic stations, and including the recent bushrock ones from Southern Africa and from our recent Namibian experiment, and repeating that work and trying to get a lot closer image of the um, anisotropy in Southern Africa. Work like that is done part of it. It's part of the Sarsi experiment by Paul Silver and his students and colleagues. And now we are extending that with many more stations to look at those issues. And then finally, just to pull it together, and this is a group from Australia, in fact, that took some of our seismic information that we've done and combined it with many other sources of data. 
And we had to come up with, I guess, to my knowledge, the best uh, model of the uh, of the lithosphere underneath southern well, Africa, south of the equator that exists. They really beat us to it. I, I guess this is something that we we intended to do, and we'll still work in this direction, but they had the tools and the people in place. But yeah, what is possible? So uh, just from the seismic wave, we can come up with seismic velocity, but what does it mean? Is it a, is the has got the inner chemistry of the map below, or is it the temperature or a mixture of the two? And so what they did, and they say inverted the elevation data, the surface heat flow, the Gravity anomalies, geoid and all we contributed really with the Rayleigh wave data. So, an important but not the only part of it. The noise geography also came from our station, of course, constrained with xenoliths and xenocrysts, so that's the geochemical side. And they came up to try to determine what is the temperature, the pressure, and male element composition necessary to satisfy all of that data and to really to model the little boundary and the third. Mantle. And this is really the uh, three dimensional model uh, shown over here where they were able to look and try to sort out areas where you know, you've got some hot upwellings, where you've got deep keels, and this is the best solution that they could find that satisfied those disparate data sets like that. So, a very fine piece of work over here. And I guess we will continue to test any new models and any new data against this and see where, whether their model holds up well or not. So really, uh, the finding of that, uh, I suppose, uh, integrating paper, there was that, you know, Pratons really have diverse structures and compositions and distinct evolutionary parts, uh, paths, some protonic features of the lithosphere. That's of our Kraton, the one we stand in right now has been retained. Others have lost their uh, Kratonic features deeper down below, and others have had it altered. So, you know, uh, unsurprisingly, there's no simple model, well, you know, that fits everything. It, different things that have happened in different parts of Africa. But just to su summarize up, where are we now with Africa array? Um, we, of course, uh, are continuing with our studies of mantle anisotropy. That's what has currently been looked at and studied. Um, also, this Bushveld array, it's complementary to a project that Sue leads, which is the International Continental Scientific Drilling Program project to drill into the Bushveld complex and understand the whole structure and its evolution over time. And so we hope our seismic images of the lower crust upper mantle will contribute to that. And also just to note, we were expecting David Koza to be here earlier, but the Council of Geoscience has got a program where they are starting to put a moving array which will cover the whole of South Africa from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean on a 50 kilometer grid. So it's a fantastic experiment and they're still lost. I heard you procuring the instruments. So they haven't actually started. They did something similar with Magnetotelluric that's already underway. But at the same time, we in fact have been able to secure funding under Musa Manzi's leadership to, from the Petroleum Agency of South Africa to do uh, work in the Karoo Basin, looking at perhaps, uh, issues around trail gas uh, exploration and development. And through that, we are interested in looking at the structure of the Karoo Basin and any seismicity that might be there. So some seismic stations have been deployed as part of that. So that is what we are involved in. Yeah. So really, in the past four or five years, there's been continual, it's an incremental but steady advance in knowledge of the deep structure and deep dynamics of Africa south of the equator. And this, I want to emphasize, of course, we work with colleagues in the in the north and we rely on their support. Uh, but it's really to uh, have as much of this being done in Africa by African scientists and institutions. And these are some of the, I suppose, goals that we're working on, working towards towards the future. That is it. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. That was awesome. Uh, we have time for questions. Malaika? Um, I just wanted to ask, this is what the African scientists are saying in the States. Is this is this openly available? Is it acceptable events? Where do we find the data? Right, the, the, the data that is curated by IRIS, the Incorporated Research Institute for Seismology, which is a US-based one, but they look after that curation. So it is in the public domain, but generally when the data is collected, we have a moratorium period to allow our students to work on it. People have sweated over the data. 
uh, and so uh, before it goes public domain. But if anybody from abroad says, can we have some of the data um, uh, oh, that is currently being collected, our question is, what can you do for an African student? And so often that uh, involves a, a sharing of perhaps a code or somebody going across on a research visit. And so we're very open to, let's say, to negotiation. But the data is will eventually all be open uh, in the public domain. And much of it is already. In order to access it, you need to get a password and things like that. But it won't, no request is reasonably refused. Okay, there are no questions online. By the way, we still have time for coffee, isn't it so? So if you have more questions and some discussion points, we can go over those during coffee break. Um, the next speaker, thanks, Ray. We're moving from... We're moving, we're moving from large scale to small scale projects, of course, from professors to a PhD student. So everything is shrinking. Um, uh, let me try to be the chair and the IT person at the same time. Raise your talk, please. Yeah. I really can't see that. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see it. Okay. Uh, Kenneth Rampelso is a PhD student at Vet University. He is managing some papers here in the next few days. Um, he's going to be talking about the interface geophysics. So it's been at first for more than two years. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the colors here. It's difficult to see. I can see them probably here, but uh, it's a bit difficult to see them there. Uh, maybe it's my color blindness that came to me when I was busy doing the presentation. But today I'm just going to go through. Uh, some of the work that I've done uh, throughout my PhD, uh, which uh, I'll just give a, a short one on one of the case studies which we worked on in the Bushwa complex at um, seven nine. So, but before we go into that, I just wanted to talk about the, the Next Generation Explorer Award that we participated in uh, last year, which was a great competition that we. Uh, participated in it's part of it formed part of the saga conference that we attended in uh, late November last year, where different teams with different people from uh, different fields were participating in uh, the competition. Where we had a geophysicist as myself, an environmentalist, a medical technologist, geophysicist, geophysicist, and a, 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 a geologist also uh, forming part of our team. So the whole idea is to bring different fields and integrate different fields into uh, solving geological problems and everything. So one of the problems that we were looking at, we had data set from the Council of Geoscience, where we were looking at exploration at the Okip uh, Copper District, seeing if we can be able to use the open source data to do exploration in such environments. It's on to present uh, our results at the Saga conference and we managed to win uh, the competition at the Saga conference as I was part of that team. And the winners of the Africa uh, NGEA Award, uh, Award, they get an opportunity to travel to Canada and participate in the uh, PDAC conference that uh, was happening beginning of March. So we formed part of the finalists. We were impact explorers and also another team uh, from vets who participated in the, as finalists. So there were two finalists that managed to go to PAC uh, So here we had some of our members in Canada at the conference presenting uh, some of the work that we've done competing in that conference. Unfortunately, we didn't manage to win at the PAC, but this for me is a, a stepping stone for us this year to participate again for more students to participate in the competition and be able to uh, 
uh, get a chance to participate at the next PDAC conference. So now going into what I'll be talking about, uh, I'll just speak through my PhD journey, where I started and where I am at the moment, and also give you a background of the study that I was telling you that I would go through, which is the surface analysis that we did at my seven mile. And so the need for us to do this research starts with uh, us needing uh, more minerals in, in industry, and uh, these minerals form the critical minerals such as uh, your platinum elements. They, they are very crucial in our industry in seeing the global transition that we're going into. It's very important for us to be able to uh, find more of these minerals in South Africa. So with Africa being one of the continents that is rich with minerals, we need to be able to uh, position ourselves into the global transition of uh, this minerals. So now what I will take you through is we'll look at how then uh, my study uh, goes into that factor of global transition into looking at uh, finding this critical minerals such as PGE because we're working in the bushfire complex. So now what we were trying to do is can we use the, the, the underground spaces that we already have to then uh, image the critical uh, minerals such as your, 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 your UG2s and Marinsky reefs and everything with the existing tunnels that are in, uh, uh, in, in place. And also will our geophysical equipment that we currently have be able to be utilized in such environments where you don't have a GPS uh, uh, in those environments and also there is a lot of noise that is happening in that uh, uh, in those spaces so what we did is that we then tried to design the seismic experiments such that we'll be able to uh, image those uh, geological structures and the mineralization in those environments and also uh, improve the signal to uh, to depth penetration and compare some of the signals between the sources so before we go into the technical aspect of that we look at where it all started. It started with me uh, being in Kretov and seeing a video of uh, Musa Manzi on YouTube and seeing that he's the first uh, Black South African uh, geophysicist. And what I wanted from that was to then to rub shoulders with such people in the industry. So, <laughs> That is then when I registered with Matt to do my PhD in uh, mathematics and physics, and then did my honors in geophysics. Then I finally managed to work with Musa in my honors here, or geophysics, and then started to play around with the equipment. And now I have more access to it uh, at that time, participated in more field work, gained more confidence in presenting some of the data sets, and that helped me to end up going to Saga conference where I presented some of my results at that time. And the love for geophysics carrying on to continue, as you can see here, uh, I was putting some seismographs on my arms. As I've already mentioned that the whole idea was to rub shoulders with some of the great uh, geophysicists in the industry. I managed to uh, be with uh, the likes of Pro Grace, Pro Sue, uh, Oleg uh, from Alereza from Uppsala, Poye, and Valentino from uh, Italy. Also managed to attend the Africa Oil Week in that year and managed to attend some of the deep mining uh, uh, conferences that were available in that year. So from then, that's when I joined the Mandela Mining Precinct to work uh, as an intern there. And from there, that's when I started being part of the AOK program, which then now goes into uh, how I ended up doing my PhD in the field that I'm in with the tunnel seismic uh, stuff. So before we go into that again, now the question is where are we as seismic research center from when I joined the group? So we started off from when I joined, we were just using the conventional stuff with the weight drop, the cable system and everything. We did small surveys just by the bus stop and then from there, we moved on to acquire a lens streamer 
that was now much easier for us to utilize on such areas. You can imagine how it is difficult to plant your receivers and everything in such an environment. So from acquiring this uh, lens streamer, it was much easier now for us to acquire some seismic data. But then the lens streamer didn't see much of uh, utilization of which it's where now we would encourage some of the honors and MSc students to utilize that equipment as it already exists. So we moved now to now higher of the high-end equipment, which are the remote acquisition units, which now you don't have more cables, you just run in the field. And uh, moved real peak from being hired to the department actually owning some of the equipment. We managed to uh, acquire some of this equipment in the department and reduce the cost of doing field work from hiring that equipment. It was then very quick that we acquired the uh, 500 GPEG uh, source, which is named after the Prof Ray, which is the Darhama, uh, that we are now utilizing in the field. Now, let's go into the technical uh, aspect of the presentation where I look at application of this geophysical methods for mineral exploration in the Bushfield complex. So the study area that we were using here as part of the AOK and the Vet Seismic Research Center collaboration was Maseve Mine, which is a test mine that is about 88 kilometers from the Rustenburg town. So the mine is open for uh, scientists, researchers to do uh, mining related research in the mine. So if you have ideas of maybe mining, geophysics and all sorts of things, you are able to talk with the Mandela Mining Precinct and conduct your research in that mine. The mine is put under care and maintenance. So there's no activity at the moment in the mine. So it is a good site for your uh, test site. So the target for us was uh, to see if we can be able to use the marine skiri and UG2 in that area. But the first thing that we need to do before we can go into the field and try to image those things, the question is, will you be able to detect that Marinsky reef and the UG2 that you are trying to image? So what we do first is to create synthetic, uh, 1D synthetic models from the boho data that we have, where you have different physical properties like your velocity and uh, density where your acoustic impedance uh, contrast will then give you a, a difference. So when the rocks have enough uh, uh, contrast, then you'll be able to see them. So from that, we see that the Marinsky reef gives you a, a good signal on the, on the synthetic data. Also the UG2 is gonna give you the signal. But what you need to uh, keep in mind, the UG2 and the Marinsky reef are two things for you to actually be able to resolve them. So what we use is the contact between the hanging wall and the foot wall is actually the reason why you're getting the reflection from that. So we use those as a proxy to actually image where your UG2 or your Marinsky reef is sitting uh, underground. So from that, we had phase one of underground uh, seismic surveys where we collected the data underground uh, at about 500 meters below surface. We planned different seismic profiles here uh, uh, with consideration of how the reef was moving. So the one interesting aspect about this uh, place is that the Marinsky Reef and UG2, they have this undulating form that they keep moving up on your hanging wall and then they uh, get back into your foot wall. So that is one thing that we also wanted to check if we would be able to image some of the sections of the UG2 and Marinsky Reef that uh, are there. So the mine provided us with uh, a section of the block where we have the uh, model of the Marinsky Reef and the UG2 uh, in those sections. So one of the challenging things that you would have in underground conditions when you're collecting seismic data is uh, background noise. So you need to keep in mind that when you go underground, they have to switch on the pumps for ventilation so that you'll be able to get good air. But those nations, what they do now is they cause uh, uh, vibrations in those environments, which then ends up contaminating your data set. You also have water that is flowing in the mine as we are 
already below the water table. So water is going to flow in, in your mine, which you have a water pump that is sitting here to pump out that water that is there. So with this water pump uh, in operation, then that causes your uh, noise into your seismic data, which we recorded that background noise you can see from here, such that we'll be able to look at it properly in our seismic data. So now looking at what we have, when we conducted this study, we only had uh, the lens streamer and the conventional geophones that have spikes. So what we were doing now is we tried to compare the results from the lens streamer and the planted geophones. And you can see from the planted geophones that your data is a bit uh, noisy compared to the one that you have or of a, a lens stream. So even when we process it, you are able to see that you can, the lens streamer data compared to the uh, geophone, uh, a planted geophone. So one other thing that we try to do now to increase the coupling of the uh, planted geophone was to use a drill and drill into the hard rock. Keeping in mind that unlike on surface, on surface it's easier to plant the geophones on loose soil, but in underground conditions you are sitting on hard rock. So it is going to be difficult for you to actually plant these geophones in those conditions. So what we try to do now to mitigate the coupling issue was to drill holes into the uh, rock and also, and then plant those receivers. One other thing that we learned the hard way, unfortunately, when we were busy drilling on some of the rocks there, uh, some of our drill bits melted while we were busy uh, drilling there. So some, we ended up learning so many things in that aspect of our survey. So now looking at some of the results that we got from uh, this data set, from that uh, model that I uh, gave you earlier, as I've mentioned that the reef in that region is undulating. So this uh, result, this text section that you get is for this uh, line here, where your model shows you that the reef in this section here is a bit flat. As, as you approach a region here, the, red, the green part here shows where there is a, a mapped uh, geological structure, which is a fault that exists in this region. And as you go up now, your reef now goes into your hanging wall. So our results here show this strong reflection that we have here. And you can see at the end, at, at the beginning of this profile, there's also a, a, some reflections coming up in there, which we, correlates this to probably being a geological structure, which a fault that exists in that region that has uh, displaced this uh, uh, reflection that is on this section. So the question now, is this reflection your UG2 or your marine series, or even your UG1 that can be, that might be uh, at greater depth in those regions. So that's some of the results that we got from the, the underground operation. So from that, then we create a 3D view of the results so that we, 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 where we integrate all the seismic profiles that we collected in, in that region. Now, when we look at that, doing some model on the structural interpretation in the region, where now we have all these uh, structurally interpreted uh, structures in the region where the red dot shows the depth of your marine stream and the blue one is the depth of your UG2. So when you superimpose your, your, your uh, reef models on the, on, the 3D mod, on the 3D structures that we have models, you can clearly see that some of these structures that we've interpreted uh, cross cuts the uh, reefs in this region in, in that direction, which might be the reason why your reef is a bit higher in that uh, side. So now in phase two, then we decided that why not conduct a survey on surface? And at the time we conducted this survey now, it's when we had uh, procured the Darhama. We also had the nodes that we could use on surface that are much easier to deploy compared to the cable system. And the cable system, we were limited to only 48 channels at that time, because we only had 48 channels. So you couldn't do long profiles such that you'd be able to penetrate at greater depth. Keeping in mind, as the reefs that you see here, they are at 500 meters below surface. So with your 48 
channels that we had, we only uh, had a, a profile length that could go only at 250 meters, which was a bit difficult for you to actually uh, be able to image such uh, uh, stuff. So, so that's a profile that was two kilometers long. That direction where the uh, tunnel entrance Uh, to here. So we put the seismic from direct on top of uh, experiments uh, at that time. So from there, we had to DGBS our code also. We also have uh, an event that we also have that time tags uh, uh, our data set because with this system, what you do is that you don't see your data set as you're collecting it compared to the previous system that we used to do. So you just collect, uh, hoping that you did program them right, because there was an instance where we did go to the field, we spent seven days in the field, only to find out when we come back from the field that the, the units were not programmed, they did not record anything, they only recorded for one hour in that uh, seven days. So, which is something that you always learn along the way. We learned the hard way, unfortunately, but now we are more confident in using this. So we know how to program them properly and collect the data, which you should be seeing some of the results that come out from uh, some of these projects that we've been doing using this uh, systems that we have in the department. So with the lines that we collected, we managed to use those two, we managed to use those uh, 200 uh, receivers, with, which is the longest line, and the other two lines that were there, we managed to use about 90, about 100 uh, receivers, with the number of shots being 792, with uh, Prof. Uh, Ray being, uh, Prof. Musa being our, our technician on this day, where he was driving the, the, the bobcat for us, and with uh, four stacks that we did in that region, but what we also wanted to see is we wanted to compare the data set that we're going to get from the cable system versus the uh, uh, units that we uh, put in. So from that, we get to see the raw shot gather here and a processed one. What you can realize is that this is for the 96 uh, rows that we use, is the shorter line. What you realize is that at the far offset, there is a bit of noise compared to the near offset. So what this is, is the fact that when we collected the seismic data, let me go back to this picture. When we collected the seismic data, if you can see clearly here, you see there are these cables here and that one. There are electric and power lines that are sitting in that area. So what this, we know in South Africa that our power line, our electrical cables have 50 hertz, uh, frequency. So what they do now, when you're collecting your data in such environment, they introduce this 50 hertz noise that you will have in your uh, power offset. But with processing and also looking into your, uh, your spectrum and your, your FK, you can be able to remove the 50 hertz out of your data and get the data to be clean, which you can see here is much clearer for this, which is continuous compared to where now you couldn't see it properly in that region. So also, for example, as I've mentioned, that you can apply some uh, processing steps to filter out, example, the ground rows that you have here, keeping in mind that in seismics, you have all the signals that are in your data set, your ground rows, your first, uh, your direct arrivals and everything. But those are regarded as your noise because you don't want to use it. We're only interested in reflections. So, Anything that you're not interested in on your short data, we are trying to remove it. So from that, what we were trying to remove, we we're trying to remove some of the ground rows that we have here, of which here yeah, you can see this reflection is much clearer in that region. Even this side, it comes out uh, at side. But one thing that you need to be careful when you're processing seismic data is you introducing artificial uh, reflections or artificial uh, events in your data set. So it is very important to spend a lot of time on your data set processing it than uh, ending up creating artificial reflections that actually don't exist. 
So from that data set, when we did our stack section, which is uh, preliminary results for now, we did manage to get the near surface ones that are a bit uh, not clear, but the combination of the lens streamer data that we also collected, we hope that we'll be able to use that data to then resolve the, the first few uh, milliseconds of the data set. But as you move down these 500 uh, milliseconds, as you move down to about 100 to 150, you can see our clear reflections that come in and you also have undulation. So what we are trying to do now is now integrate this surface data set with the other data set be able to see if there are any, did we image some of the, uh, we imaged on the uh, underground data. Sorry. So now in summary, we did manage to show that with the equipment that we have, we can be able to collect seismic data environment and be able to image and also integrate some of the 2D models that we have, boho data and geological information to improve our seismic uh, data uh, interpretation. Uh, our surface seismic data is currently being integrated with the tunnel seismic data, as I've mentioned, for correlation with the boho found in the area. So now, going back to where we are, uh, a seismic research center, we did manage to get exposed to some of the state of the art equipment, which your three components uh, receivers that we uh, managed to be exposed to when we visited Uppsala University in Sweden. We also had the uh, MIMS uh, uh, latest, not latest, there are much, there are others that are more recent now compared to this one. These ones are called WIMS compared to this one. So, what these ones have. They don't have the cables that connect to this unit, or the geophone is connected directly on this unit. So now you're reducing also having to move around your, your cables and everything. So the, this is some of the equipment that we we're exposed to. It didn't take uh, much long for us to also be, this was for the first time for me seeing a Nomad uh, 15 vibrocyte where in Sweden in operation, but it didn't take as much time for us to actually have the equipment in South Africa, we did manage to also get ourselves the three components uh, uh, geophones. They are here in, in the department. We also have the two vibrant size trucks that uh, are at the back. These are rented, unfortunately, they are not ours, but you never know. Who knows? We might have one in the next few years or something. And now, currently, we are able to use the uh, mini vibes that are in the county. Uh, I don't know if it's an unfortunate situation or what. With the equipment being here, you don't have much days to spend at home. So I ended up spending my birthday in the field collecting the seismic data. So thank you. That's all good. Thank you, Kenneth, for giving a, such a good talk. I'm sure the reason is not because you have drug locks. It's for, for the other. I'm sure we've got some time for uh, quick questions for Kenneth. Uh, he just returned from the field last night. So. <laughs> Any question? Quick question? Okay, let's, um, I think we're on time. We have the last speaker before the coffee break. Is it so? Yeah, one more. Yeah, yeah so. Um, so Thanks again. Give Kenneth the big round of applause. There are no questions online as well. So that's good. Okay. Okay. Take the How did they know? Yeah. 
school. Um, Drea is a master's student at the end of her master's. She's done some amazing work at the Bush Light Conference again, looking at near public buildings and also looking at water as such. And the, the, the mine was flooded. So today you can take to us your, your research. All right. So I'm just going to talk about my research, well, my master's research, which is an integrated approach to characterize the subsurface using near surface geophysical methods. So this is just what we're going to be going through in my PowerPoint. And on the left, you can see that this is a problem we were dealing with. There was this area in the mine where they wanted to actually expand the mine. And you know, mine's all about productivity. So now this water was actually impeding on that productivity. So just the introduction. Um, so obviously one of the most problematic aspects in mining is um, properly man uh, managing your groundwater flows because uh, dewatering schemes can be very expensive. And with the right management, water management program, you can actually eliminate the use of those finances. Um, so just the area, uh, it's, we're looking at the Teresa mine, which was on the southwestern limb of our Bushveld uh, complex, um, which we know is known for PGM deposits. Uh, but in Teresa, we more focused on our critical zone in our uh, Rustenburg layered suites. Um, so those are our anorthosite, norite, pyroxenite, hardsburgite, and dunite bearing rocks. And we were more focused on our MG group, which is our middle group chromatite layers. Um, in, in layered suites. So just an in-situ example of what it looked like in our mine. Um, we have a dike in this area and then we have our MG4 at the top and then it goes towards our MG3 at the bottom. So we can see that our Yanging direction is actually towards the south in our area. So just the aims and objectives. So we wanted to delineate our shallow um, subsurface geological features and fluid migration pathways that were linked to our water source. And then one of the objectives is to image and investigate our subsurface architecture. Um, we did this by several ways. So the first one was using hydrogeology. So we use stable isotopes, which are delta 18 O and delta 2 H. And then we also use radioactive isotopes, which is our 3 H or tritium, which helped us understand our conceptual groundwater flow and water source for the mine. And then we also use um, various geophysical techniques, which was our electrical resistivity, our MASW, which is our surface wave analysis, seismics and magnetics, which assisted in delineating our fluid migration pathways and to authenticate our isotope results. So I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the methods. So with the hydrogeology, we used our liquid water isotope analyzer, um, analyzer in the VITS lab, and I did this stable isotope analysis. But then with our radioactive isotopes, I have to send it to a timber labs um, to get analyzed. And then um, for our relativity, we have our ABEM 1200 multi electrode un uh, units. And then MASW, we used our standard um, CMP roll along technique um, with our uh, lands server. And then um, just these are the parameters of our MASW. We did do seismics and magnetics, but that was more focused by my colleague, Kenneth, um, in his paper. So just our study areas, we had very studious areas in the mine. We had our far west pit, our west pit, east pit, and then our two tailings dams, um, tailings dam two and tailings dam one. Um, now we're moving on to our stable isotopes. So with our stable isotopes, there were three main um, sources of information that we could see. We had a very highly enriched isotope signature. So this is caused probably by fractionation during evaporation, because what happens is that during evaporation, your heavier isotopes get left over um, in your surface waters and your lighter uh, isotopes will get evaporated. So now what you're measuring at surface is that you're having a more enriched or more positive isotope signature. Then we also had our, our various isotopes, so now again, these are more enriched in your lighter isotopes. So now these are more your deeper groundwater flow systems or recharge that was infiltrating for many, many years. And then we also had an active um, water recharge zone, which uh, basically demonstrates our kind of intersection point between our depleted and enriched isotope signatures. And then um, 
active surface water mixing. Because what happens is that you'll have this uh, more enriched mixing with this lighter isotope signature. And now you have this intermediate value. So that was what we were seeing. And then some examples. So for example, this tailings dam um, sample number, I think it was tailings dam two and this monitoring bohole, they had the same isotope signature. So when two isotopes plot exactly on the same point, you can say that they kind of um, have the same recharge zone or um, kind of, uh, how do you say it? Like refilling at the same time point. So now that means that this monitoring bohole and this tailing exams storage facility sample kind of has a mixing of the two. So there was a seepage probably from the, the, the borehole into the tailing exam or vice versa. We also then did with our stable isotopes plotted against our electrical conductivity. So this gives you the degree of mineralization. So if your mineralization is due to evaporation, um, which will cause a more enriched um, delta 18 O or oxygen 18. So what we had is that we had isotopes or um, sample waters that due to evaporation were heavy and more enriched. And then we had low EC values or electrical conductivity values, um, probably due to our rainfall signature because those are more recent recharges. We can also have high EC due to water rock interaction at depth. The water interacts with your rock, um, it moves through groundwater and then those, that water will actually get enriched um, or sorry, it will actually lose um, your isotope signatures and then get more depleted over time. Um, then we had groundwater. If we have, um, looking at this graph, groundwater that has almost positive trend with your e uh, electrical conductivity, that means that your um, samples are probably undergoing ground um, evaporation, sorry. So in this diagram, um, we, we obtained an R squared value of 0 0.005. So most of our samples had an increase in electrical conductivity without much changes in our isotope uh, composition, which again, may be due to our mineralization. But then few of our sample waters did show um, enrichment, for example, this point T4. Um, so an enrichment in more heavier isotopes, which had an increase in our electrical conductivity. So maybe again, recharged by evaporated water. Um, but then we had these two contrasting views, which um, begged us the question, could repumping be the cause of the water that we were seeing in the pit? Because when water is pumped and um, used for dewatering, it can re-enter the pit via lineaments. So what we saw at this point in the mine is that we actually had our dike and fault interacting. And then at this point, we had a very high um, flow rate, about maybe a liter per minute, which is not characteristic of groundwater that would undergo um, normal circulation. So that means that there has to be an external cause causing this higher um, pumping or um, infiltrating rates. So then we needed to see our tritium analysis. So this is our radioactive isotope. And what we, we can use with our radioactive isotopes is that it gives us our radioactive decay, which we can use to date our isotope. So tritium has a um, decay rate of about 12.4. Um, years. So what we did is that using this equation, we used our final, of our initial, our final value is what we're seeing in the water, um, groundwater samples, and our initial was the average rainfall at that rate. So I think I used 5.6 tritium units. And then what you can do is actually plot and get the age values of each of your sample waters. So looking at our tritium graph, we had um, recent recharge areas, which had a very elevated isotope signature. So again, possible rainfall. And then we had um, highly depleted isotope signatures. Um, but also these, what was weird is that these signatures also had a little bit of an elevated um, tritium level. So it could allude to the fact that there could be uh, depleted moisture from a geographical isolated or different um, area. And then we had very depleted groundwaters over here, um, which um, could again uh, demonstrate our deep circulating water. And then what I wanted to do is see the different recharge zones or areas. So I plotted a contour map um, 
uh, joining areas of equal tritium value, which again, our tritium value is our residence time. So areas that are joined, you can see that they have the same recharge um, time periods. So when I wanted, then I blew this up in 3D and then plotted it as a function of elevation. What I, I saw from this map is that the higher elevations had more enriched isotopes while my depleted isotopes are more concentrated at the pits, which makes sense because that's where you're gonna go reach your groundwater table. A lot of fractures and lineaments in the mine, we have our active mixing zone. So now that means that this enriched water that we're seeing at the higher elevations are actually moving through fractures. And then when they're moving through fractures, depleting over time and then giving us our active mixing. So now these lineaments and to map the lineaments, we use geophysical methods. So, so um, these two tailing exams, we did MASW and resistivity line. Um, then all these blue grids are magnetic grids that we use our walk mag to do. And what our results showed is that when we integrated our different geophysical results, so at the one tailing one, we integrated our resistivity with our MASW. And what we saw is that our low shear wave zones were correlating to our more um, conductive surfaces, which makes you want your low shear wave zones are usually your higher um, seismic energy attenuation zones, um, which again is for gives you a higher conductivity zone. So with our MSW, we were able to see this kind of structure, which um, had a low to medium um, seismic, I mean, shear wave velocity, about 600 to 800 um, meters per second, and then correlated to this conductive zone over here. So we thought there could be a perched aquifer, but I think to for me to actually understand if that was a perched aquifer, I would have to maybe plot an inverse model of my conductivity because we know the conductivity is the inverse of our resistivity and that would actually tell me is that a conductive zone if it's conductive it'll be a perched aquifer then then um we also got our uh we also were able to plot fracture systems um which was our low um or our conductive zones or low resistive um zones and those also correlated to uh, low shear wave velocity zones. So again, you can see that we have shallow surface water probably mixing with deep surface water and giving us our active mixing. Then we did a long tier, our tailing storage facility too. We again integrated our resistivity with our MASW. And again, we saw that we had maybe more saturated zones, which is our um, conductive zones or low resistivity uh, zones and then um, very conductive, um, less conductive or very resistive um, zones. So along here, we also were able to see a lineament, again, showing our surface water and deep water mixing. And over here, we have a deep infiltration zone. We'll be mixing our here um, water or saturated zone at the near surface, and then a probably water saturated zone here in our deeper surface. And then with our magnetic grids, what we were able to see is that we saw this very high magnetic feature um, along all the grids. And what we realized is that this is actually the imaging of our dike in our area. And then we also had um, low uh, mag um, magnetic zones, which were probably our fracture systems. So now the problem is that we have fracture systems intersecting a dike zone which probably could increase our permeability of our rocks or um, allow for um, groundwater movement through these lineaments, right? Because now it's gonna increase our permeability and then increase the process of pore fluid pressure. Um, this is more what Kenneth was working on, but what he wanted to do is um, associate our resistivity with our seismic sections. And what we also saw is that we were able to image a dike and um, a fault zone in our two sections. But again, this is more of what he was looking into. I just wanted to touch it. And then um, when we integrated all three data sets, you could actually see that there were lineaments um, 
intersecting each other. So again, this is going to increase the um, kind of of the idea that, that we could have groundwater movement and mixing zones in this area, which again complicates us to see where's the actual source of this water. Um, but the summary is that we integrated our geological, our, our hydrological and geophysical results, and we were ab able to map our fluid migration pathways and lineaments. And when we integrated all of these results in an, our open pits, we could see that we had distinct fracture zones or um, systems that could contribute to our groundwater. Um, that our large aquifer groundwater um, was accessed through our continuous mine development, because obviously we're going deep in the surface and promotes our increasing groundwater flows in that open pit. So that, that water that they are seeing at the bottom of the pit where they want to um, extend basically. Aquifer ability to transmit and store groundwater is significantly be increased in the vicinity of our open, our open pit. And the possible causes for this could be unloading of macro, um, rock, rock masses, um, blasting activities, and dewatering scheme, because these are all going to increase our fracture networks. And then our geological, our hydrogeological and geophysical results complemented each other in that the main sources of water that we could see from the mine is probably our river water, because we had a river system flowing through it, um, water that's being recycled via our dewatering systems. Um, through our lineaments, we had a tailings dam seepage, um, and then we could also have mixing of our rainwater or surface water with our deep or conic water sources. So again, just to show you, we had a dike intersecting our faults, and thank you. Thank you, I think one thing to add is that actually there was an underground mine that also with water. So some of water might have been um, brought to the surface. Um, don't run away. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing very well. We're on time. Um, time for questions. And so? I just want to ask the Supreme Valley, did you, did you have any that were like renowned for Yes, uh, we did. Um, if I can go. Uh, yeah, so that's when you, you did a couple of places to look for, you know, extremal files and, and yeah. other things. So these values, um, T1, uh, where was it? Yeah, T1 was actually um, one of the open pit samples. And that had a very, very low tritium value. And if you can see from the age value, it was about 60 years. So that was a very deep. Um, circulating water that didn't be hasn't been mixed with anything, but obviously when they were extending the mine, we got closer and closer to the the deeper groundwater system. Yeah. So there is a deep system. Yes. yes. Been no. That's quite interesting. Yeah. That's why it made it so complicated because now I had these different sources and it was hard to actually see what was the cause of each thing. Yeah. Yeah. Most of shit. Quick. Oh, the the pitch aquifers. Yeah, this this one. Yes. Yeah, so actually we requested that from the mine and all they gave me was that. So it seemed like their monitoring boreholes weren't looking at different physiochemical properties in that. So then I did a physical chemi uh, chemical property, right? So I did a physical chemi uh, chemical property analysis and everything. I just didn't go into detail with this, but what I did want to do is that I was trying to relate this to my electrical conductivity values because I, if I could see the conductivity of this, it would give you what type of soil or what type of rock it is. And then so I see, is this an aquifer? Is this just um, some layer, um, water layer that's been now embedded here? But, but if you look at the surrounding areas, it was confusing because this still has a low, um, a low resistivity value. So for perch, for it to be a perch aquifer, you would expect this to be um, more resistive, right? Because it would be separated from the groundwater system. So that was what I was struggling with. Now. So that's where I'm 
taking it. Yes. Thanks, Julia. Thank you for coming. If you have more questions, um, by the way, I must emphasize that so did visit us on the page here. We were doing a survey inside the peak, and that's very difficult. So we were targeting areas where the miners and the trucks drivers were going on lunch, and we ran with the magnetometer. So it was the good news is that at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, I have a meeting with the mine. They've opened the site again, so we have approved the budget to actually fly the thing with the UAV system. So next week we start in the UAV survey on the same mine. So we'll be flying the peaks. So we're no longer walking. So um, with uh, so thanks so much, Jurea. And in fact, we do have a bit of five minutes. There's a video that's in the system, which is part of uh, okay. um, the I think five minutes month. So if I can get to play this, it would be great. Um, the video so asked me to play this. It's about the recent. Um, work we're doing, which is part of the future projects. I gave a talk on this a few days ago. Where is the video? There's a lot of stuff here, as you can see. <laughs> is this the right flash drive? There should be a way to your talk. Is that your talk? Yeah. It should be this one. I won't be able to play for those online, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I can share it.
Thank you. Okay, is it online? Yeah. Not online. Okay. It's not worth putting. It was a good session. I think so. It's over to you now. I think it's time for coffee. Yeah. So we. I'm going to take a little break. So let's have coffee. We'll come back and continue with science. Thank you. Thank you. For those online, we're going for coffee break. We'll be back in ten minutes. Don't leave your laptops in the house, but I'm not going to stay in the house.
People who are I can see there's someone joining from this video. From what? Um, I'm sure you can see there. Let's see. Let's expose them. Here they are. They went for coffee as well. Also, nine people do go for coffee. So there were six, not four. We have ten now. Okay. Hello to our online guest. I guess if you talk, we can't hear you, but we're greeting you hello, the hello. Thank hello. you for being hello. with us. Hello, hello. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Anyone online, if you want to wave, say a few words of. Okay, let's get started. We are back. Okay, Chris, I'm looking for your talk. Where is Chris? Is it? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Because the, the color is so bad on the projector. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, okay. Um yeah, so we can use actually if you want it. It looks like that on the actual screen. Yes. <laughs> Give a round of applause to our new ICS station. Step in. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone for getting back on time. Uh, we continue with our scientific discussion. Our next speaker is 
uh, Chris Harris, who's going to be taking us through his research. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Red Waters Fund, uh, hosted by or supervised by Zube. Uh, his title is Red Quart Formation, a highlighted to sedimentary report of the late Devonian in Gondwana. Over to you, Chris, and thank you. Thank you, Wilson. All right. First of all, thank you, Sue, and the school, and all of you for the opportunity to talk about some preliminary results for my PhD. Um, I have a background in paleontology and sedimentology, and I will be using these proxies as well as ecology, the study of trace fossils, to try and draw together a picture of the late Devonian in Gondwana. Okay, so to start with, um, public protest. I have to extend my gratitude to those who are out toy toying and even throwing stones. This was the 1980s in Grahamstown when people got out onto the streets to stop cars on the night. And as a result, the apartheid government decided to divert the highway around the town. And when they cut into the hills around Grahamstown, they cut into some beautiful fossils. And when I was an undergrad working on excavating on that site at Waterloo Farm, I started to realize that there are some geological problems that we have that uh, are going to need some attention. So without these protests, I probably wouldn't be doing this research project. Okay, so the Lake Devonian is a really interesting time in evolution and Earth history. Uh, for one, we had the evolution of tetrapods, as in fish that have fingers and toes. Um, in the Lake Devonian, fish began to breathe air and developed arms and legs and began to seek to come out of the water. At the same time, we had forestation happening globally in the Lake Devonian period. See that fish is smiling. So this is the oldest in situ forest that we know of in the rock record, because just prior to the late Devonian in the Shibetian, about 285 million years ago. And you can see already we have <clears throat> uh, in situ roots of these trees that were up to eight meters in diameter. Um, <clears throat> but by the late Devonian forests made up of Predominantly one genus of tree called Archaeopteris had spread worldwide. This led to the drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, mostly due to silicate weathering or, or the humic acids produced by roots, which caused the weathering in, and the development of soils, um, as well as carbon burial in coals and black shales. And this has been modeled uh, according to the density of stomata in fossil plant leaves, as well as uh, carbonate in paleosols. And this all suggests that at around the late Devonian, there's a major reduction in atmospheric CO2 going into the Carboniferous. And this is compared to the height and the width of fossil plants. And the suggestion is that forests are the cause of this major carbon drawdown. Um, then right at the end of the Devonian period, we get the first continental glacial deposits since the Ordovician in about 80 million years. Um, altogether, this is the Devonian plant hypothesis here, which indicates or suggests that the climatic changes caused by forestation of Earth led to a major series of mass extinctions. Then at the same time, we have the evolution of tetrapods. As you can see from this diagram here, all of our tetrapod body fossils occur uh, in the mid Franian to Flamenian. That's right towards the end of the Devonian period. And less advanced forms, these Alpistostegid type things, Tiktalic and Pandarichthys, all occur right at the base of the Franian. And this was a beautiful evolutionary series that was described by Jenny Clack and seemed to suggest, uh, you know, perfect series of evolution that happened in the late Devonian. However, if we look at the trace fossils, we find footprints of 
walking vertebrates all the way down into the early middle Devonian. And that suggests that there's some kind of ghost lineage that tetrapods actually appeared and evolved a lot earlier than the body fossil record would suggest. And the a new working hypothesis developed by Per Alberg from Uppsala is that only by the late Devonian when we started to have anoxic settings in the marine environment did these tetrapods, which were able to breathe air, start to become very successful and radiated. Okay, so there are a series of extinction events in the late Devonian, and these are correlated across many basins worldwide. The two most important of them are the Franian and Fermanian boundary Kalvasa event, which is held as the second of the big five mass extinctions. It caused the demise of tropical reefs and huge extinctions amongst marine invertebrates. And the survivor taxa from that extinction were cold water faunas. Right at the end of the Devonian, there's the Hangenberg event, which affected vertebrates more with uh, the extinction of the dominant group of fish at the time, which were placoderms, as well as uh, serious climatic perturbations. Um, anyway, there's still a lot of debates about what was causing these extinctions, and the Devonian plant hypothesis is one of them, but I don't have enough fingers to suggest you know, all the ideas that have been proposed, and even last year, uh, solar flaring was suggested as a, a cause. Anyway, so there are these black shell horizons that are correlated widely across basins, but these events are very difficult to recognize in shallow marine strata. So here we have the Witteberg group. It is the uppermost of the three groups of the Cape Supergroup, and it ranges from uh, the upper Devonian until the lower Carboniferous. Here is the Witteberg group. <clears throat> it's made up of three units. The lower Volta Frieda formation, or in the Western Cape, the Volta Frieda subgroup, uh, the Vidport formation, and then the Lake Mens subgroup. So I'll be focusing on the Vidport formation or the latest Devonian strata in South Africa. The latest Devonian age is supported by the last appearance of placoderms in the Cape supergroup, and then lower carboniferous palynomorphs from the overlying strata as well as correlation with the global sea level curve. This was devised in 1985 by Johnson et al. And according to this curve, there was a sea level fall at the base of the Fermanian. And so we ended up getting a global regression, which explains why the sandstone dominated regressive Vitport formation was then deposited. This formation is about 350 meters thick. And basically, the only primary facies analysis from my study area is based on Fiona Taylor's honors project. And uh, in the study, Hiller and Taylor 1992, they suggested that the Vidput formation was made up of barrier island deposits, which is shown in this model here. That includes tidal channels, flood and ebb tidal deltas, lagoons, shore face deposits, beaches and dunes. Um, so that's the kind of model that we're looking at. So the Vitport formation seems to have been deposited along the east-west trending shoreline, shown by the ice pack and flow patterns here. And it is divided into three members, the bulk of which is the Roy Runt member, quite a red weathering mature quartz aronite. The Paddeport member, a very weathering uh, distinct marker unit that is about uh, 60 meters thick, so relatively thin at the top. And then a very thin conglomeratic horizon that has been suggested to be a record of the late Devonian glaciation. Now the Vidport formation is important because it is a sedimentary record of what was happening on Earth at that time in high latitude environments. And this paleographic map uh, here projects the South Pole as having been in what is today Angola. And South Africa is sitting well within 60 degrees south and probably within the Antarctic Circle by the late Devonian, and that is defined by the latitude south of which the sun doesn't rise at midwinter. Um, it's at about 68 degrees latitude today. And we're very fortunate to have the person who devises these maps here with us today, Professor Torswick. So hopefully we're gonna learn a lot more than that. And then, so the Witteberg group is special because it complete that it records a complete sedimentary succession of this time, whereas 
a glacial erosional event that happened during the Carboniferous and Permian, which is now in South Africa, reported by the Dwyker Group, cut down into all of these basins in South America and in the Falkland Islands. And so we've got probably the best place to study a full uh, sequence of what was happening in high latitude environments. High latitude forestation, well, we have the earliest evidence of trees that come from the Witwoud Formation. And in reviewing global forestation at this time, you know, here it's all suggested that the phenology of archaeopteryd forests in these zones is unknown. So we know that there were trees, but we don't understand exactly how and how widespread these forests were, or what size the trees attain. That's something that does need to be worked on. So the problem I'm looking at, the Vipport Formation is a unique for many and high paleolatitude symmetry succession. And the paleolatitude is important, but the stratigraphy and the depositional settings of the Vipport Formation are not well constrained. Hypothesize when I began my study that the Vipport Formation is a shallow marine deposit. And that we'd be able to recognize global sea level changes in the Vipport Formation succession and to be able to improve our correlation globally. So my study area is right here in the basin in and around the town of what used to be called Grahamstown is now Makanda. And this is where we have these amazing fossil localities. Because the structural deformation intensity is quite high here, we've also got a section further to the west near state level, which will help to anchor uh, this, the sequences that we are studying. So first, I want to say something just about structural geology. Um, <clears throat> the Cape Supergroup was deformed into the Cape Fold Belt during the Permian period. Um, and yeah, so the intensity of the structural deformation increases to the east into my study area and uh, it has caused the apparent thickening of all the stratigraphic units in the Cape Supergroup. So during my study, I've realized that you can't do sedimentology without paying close attention to structures. And one of the main aspects of my study is paleocurrence analysis. So before we do paleocurrence analysis, we have to use the steering and really start to enjoy um, mapping folds. This is one of the fold axes that I've mapped. It's an it's a open anticline that's plunging shallow, shallowly to the west, northwest. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's all I'm going to say about structures. Okay, so to begin with, we've got four fossil localities that I'm studying. Um, <clears throat> firstly, Howison's Poets. Uh, this is a historical locality. Um, it gives its name to a uh, stone tool industry at about 70,000 years ago, but that's not what I'm looking at. There is about 80 meters above the base of the formation, there is a black shale. Um, it contains some rather fragmentary plant remains, but in its day, um, those remains were uh, attributed to two new species by Plumstead. And she assigned them to Detoitia, which is a genus that comes from the Table Mountain group, probably um, early Devonian in age. And these are now being shown to actually be the distal fractifications of a much larger plant that was described last year. Um, a new fossil locality found in 2015 during roadworks. Um, so we found literally thousands of lingulid brachiopod shells. These are the youngest brachiopods that we know of in the Cape Supergroup. Um, it's in a mudstone unit, also about 80 meters above the base of the formation, nine meters thick, and we chased this horizon out 4.5 kilometers along strike. Um, we found that collecting a large sample of these things, we could uh, plot their lengths versus widths on a graph and show that they're a single species and that they were living in situ in their burrows in this environment, which we based on ecology and sedimentology have interpreted as a wave dominated lagoonal environment. And they co-occur with rather fragmentary plant remains as well as the disarticulated bones of fish like this arthrodia placidum skull over here. Another fossil locality from the same roadworks, Coons Hill. Um, 
So this locality contains exceptionally well-preserved plants. This is a, a complete frond of Archaeopteris notocerea, um, as well as its fertile bits, some probable marine algae, bivalves in their life position. And this sedimentary succession is duplicated around a very tight synclinal fold axis and overturned. And the structure is so complicated that I still haven't been able to resolve where in the Vidpoint formation this locality belongs. I think we might need to have some geophysics to come in to actually resolve this. <clears throat> and then Waterloo Farm, which needs no introduction. This is the site that I spoke about at the start of my presentation. 24 vertebrate taxa have been described from here, including two species of tetrapods. It's a placoderm dominated environment and also contains a lot of baby fishes, which seems to have been used as a nursery, a lot like a lot of modern estuaries today. Contains eurypterids, bivalves, six plant taxa that have been described, which is a, a fragment of the flora that's there, and all suggested to be deposited with an estuary. Um, the awesome thing about the site is soft tissue preservation. There's a whole Devonian Acanthodian preserved there in the rock. Uh, that's really rare and unique type of preservation. This locality is commonly cited as being latest Devonian in age and was thought to occur right at the top of the Vitport formation, but it hadn't been systematically shown. And this is the black shale horizon, and I've logged about 160 meters of strata to the top of the formation on top of it. So actually, this locality is not latest, uh, latest Fermanian in age, it's more probably middle Fermanian. And then I've been looking at trace fossils. Now, this is a fundamental discipline in uh, sedimentary facies analysis, and it hasn't really been looked at in the past. There's very few records of trace fossils in the literature in the Vitport formation. In the study, I'm describing 18 echinogenera, and I'll just go over a couple of them. This is Zoophycus. Um, <clears throat> popularly known from the Zoophycus echinofasces, which is considered to represent deep marine environments. Although in the Paleozoic, Zoophycus was quite common in estuaries and lagoons and in shallow marine strata. Uh, I find it in the lower of port formation, and it's, these are systematic deposit feeding burrows probably made by worms, although we don't know exactly what kind of worm made it. And then there's Spirophyton, which is very much similar to Zoophycus, except it's small. Um, and there are some subtle differences, like it has a more round outline and it lacks a, a tunnel that goes around periphery. Um, <clears throat> it's possible that spirophyton is a diminutive form that is related to environmental stress, possibly low salinities. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, found in the upper Valtafreda formation and in the Vitport formation. Tetroplasma, the locomotion traces of wedge foot bivalves. Um, it's very much, you can see the actual shape of the bivalve as it moves along and rested intermittently. These are quite common in certain horizons in the study area. And again, bivalves are very tolerant to reduced salinities. And it seems that the types of environments that we're finding these things in are brackish water settings. Cruziana problematica and Uzophycus carbonarius. Now, Cruziana is often thought to be the trace fossils of trilobites, but these are a diminutive form and uh, probably not made by trilobites, but more like something like a notostracan crustacean. This is the here. Um, <clears throat> and we only find this at one horizon in the Vitport formation, uh, just underlying the Waterloo Farm black shell, also probably from a brackish water setting. So the trace fossils occur in muddy facies and associated sandstones in very low diversity horizons, commonly are small, and that could be a brackish water indicator. Uh, so then I performed a facies analysis. Now I won't go through all these facies, but these are the primary building blocks of doing sedimentology. And none of the facies are indicative of particular environments. Um, <clears throat> I've described 14 fasces in the Bitport formation. And then those fasces are then grouped into fasces associations. Now, fasces association one, uh, this includes monotonous stacks of cross-stratified cross and structureless quartz arenites, 
often with a slight thinning and fining upward. And um, <clears throat> it includes sheet-like, very laterally extensive beds. Uh, normally at the bottom of these sequences are abundant um, intraformational mud flasks. And we also don't find fossils in these facets. Um, <clears throat> now, the kind of typical shore face model uh, has a, a characteristic sequence of progradation in which we get coarsening upwards, thickening upwards of strata as we go from sort of lower shore face to upper shore face environments. The thicker your shore face deposit, the higher the energy you see. Um, an alternative model would be graded river systems, which are more likely to form monotonous stacks, sometimes with finding upwards regressions. And also this, this type of model would explain why we're not finding mudstones in these facies. Um, <clears throat> so my interpretation of facies association one is uh, sheet braided river systems rather than shore face deposits. Then we get much more channelized, laterally restricted strata here. Um, these are developed in distinctive finding upward cycles. Um, the paleo currents indicate lateral accretion, and then at the tops of cycles, we get uh, landward sediment transport, indicating flooding or transgression. Uh, we also get very nicely preserved sedimentary structures, plant fossils, trace fossils. Um, Fasces Association 2B is very similar to 2A, except that it contains tidal indicators. And in particular, these uh, mud couplets, which are um, <clears throat> characteristic of tidal deposits where you get a dominant tide and then a slack water, and then a very thin, uh, a slack water that produces mud drape and then a very thin deposit of the subordinate tide and then another slack water and you tend to get these coupled mud, uh, mud drapes. Um, so yeah and then association three is a uh, lagoonal or estuarine basin. Um, we get very thick monotonous mudstone horizons or shales. Uh, these can be quite laterally extensive and they sometimes contain thin interbeds with wave ripples and uh, small-scale hummocky cross stratification. And then we get a lot of trace fossils too. And the biota that we're finding in these things uh, contain terrestrial and marine signals. And this is probably at the interface between those environments, uh, such as lagoons or estuaries. So I've put all these sections together into a stratigraphic model. Um, now, the three members, that have, no, have not before been recognized in the eastern part of the basin, um, I'm recognizing. Uh, the, the Paderport member, as I said, is a very white weathering, white streak. And we don't really see this in Grahamstown so much, but based on depositional facies, uh, right at the top of the succession uh, in the Grey Dam section, I'm seeing what I think is the Paderport member. The Waterloo Farm locality, as I said, sits below this horizon and is older than previously thought. And then the lower of the port formation in the easternmost part of the basin seems to have a very progradational paleo current signal and uh, more very sandstone facies association one braided river system style de deposits. As we head to, to the west, we're seeing more uh, channelization and more tidal indicators and it seems to be a slightly more distal profile with probably a, a greater intertidal signal, and this is then reflected in the paleo current signals. And then this horizon at about 80 meters above the base of the Vitport formation also seems to correlate to the thickest black shell horizon that we see there. And this could represent a big laterally extensive transgressive event. Um, I must emphasize this is a work in progress. So there is more work to do on this, but I'm hoping that once I've tied all this together, I'm going to be able to recognize bigger basin related and maybe even global sea level fluctuation signals. So to end off, my first hypothesis that the Vitport formation is a shallow marine succession, I think I can refute that. The Vitport formation is instead a continental deposit with marginal marine um, interfingering deposits that contain fossils, and these are preserved with, within the transgressive um, systems. 
Next, the eustatic global sea level fluctuations of the late Devonian. Um, this is my next phase, and whether or not I'm going to be able to recognize global sea level changes still remains to be seen. So that gets a nice question mark. Thank you. Yes, sir. Did you say something that's giving it there? Um, no, so we've got a series of shells, but they're very, very uh, thin compared to the bulk information, which is sandstones. They're not actually Thank you. Okay. And, and so that's quite a contrast of property of understand the basin. Oh, absolutely. And especially also to understand how extensive they are, whether they are continuous over hundreds of kilometers. And then also, what is the true thickness of formation? Something that's still trying to figure out. As the structure gets worse, the formation seems to thicken. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is there no um, volcanic material in, in anywhere in there? We haven't found. Can you have a question? Very simple. Would it be a modern day analog to this fire? Yeah, the world which would be similar. Yeah, um, definitely. So the greater your seasonality in fluvial systems, the more likely you are to get uh, heat flood star deposits. So in the high latitude settings, um, Norway, northern Canada, there's been beautiful descriptions of the sedimentology of. Awesome. Thanks again, please. And let's give me one. Our next speaker, who's still preparing for her presentation, uh, <laughs> it's uh, Nomboso Maduna, who is a PhD candidate in geophysics here at VETS. Uh, she will be talking about 3D evolution of the deep orange basin. I know the title because we provide. <laughs> and I'm also one of those who just came straight from the field. As you can see, she's preparing the talk while I'm introducing her. Where is it? This one? Yeah. Okay, and I'm also, I must stop the previous one first. If you're online, you can say hi, two seconds. Hi, online, if you have a mic. <laughs> All right. Uh, today we sang Happy Birthday song in English. Or so, and we will repeat it tomorrow, but we'll do it in Zulu. Okay. So you've got the whole night to prepare. Okay. Well, not tomorrow on Thursday, so it's got more than 24 hours. Happy. <laughs> yes, as well, yeah. But we'll start with a happy birthday in Zulu, which yes. I don't know myself, but I've got plans. It's not you. Oh, sorry. But it's the same thing. It's all, it's all Marines. Sorry about that. Okay. Do you see this one? All right. I nearly, nearly gave you a heart attack. Over to you. Over to you, numbers. Alright. Most working. Yeah. Yeah. I think you don't need this point. You need it. I have to show it all the time. It's fine. It's a bit frozen for some reason. It's this. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Numbu Samaduna. I'm a geology slash geophysics student. I'm uh, doing my PhD. I'm supervised by Professor Musamanzi and Dr. Zube Yena. And today I'll be presenting um, the first part of my findings in my thesis, which is the 3D evolution of the deep water orange basin, which is mostly in my first paper. So I'll, my overview is basically, I'll explain a brief introduction, my methodology, um, the results in discussion, uh, conclusions, and some acknowledgements. So for an introduction, my study area is located offshore, the Southwest, offshore of Southwest Africa in the South Atlantic Ocean. Um, I'm looking at the Orange Basin. Um, okay, this mouse is, anyway, I'm looking at the Orange Basin um, and the Deepwater Orange Basin. The uh, 3D seismic data set was uh, supplied to us by Shell. And I'm looking at a 1,800 uh, kilometer squared uh, portion within the full survey area that they conducted between 2013 and 2014. Um, my study area sits along the continental slope between 1,000 to 2,000 meter water depths. Um, what's interesting about uh, passive margins along the continental slope is that you have these gravitational collapse structures that form due to slope instability, um, which we refer to as the water fold and thrust faults. And you can see this whole region um, is basically, uh, the whole slope region is associated with uh, these deep water fold and thrust faults. Um, and uh, another interesting thing to note of why it's important of what we're studying, what we're studying, or what I'm, why I'm studying what I'm studying is because um, of the hydrocarbon potential of the basin. Um, for instance, in Namibia, you have two significant wells that have been drilled. Um, that have proliferous um, hydrocarbon uh, reserves in them, which is directly adjacent to my study area. So um, my structural framework, the Orange Basin is basically one of the uh, three major basins that are situated offshore uh, Southwest Africa during the opening of the South Atlantic um, in a zip-like fashion, your vulvous, ba vulvous basin, luteus basin, and Orange Basin and then the smaller Cape Basin to the south. Um, it's between the Rio Grande zone, uh, fracture zone to the, to the north and the Agalas Falkland fracture zone to the um, south. Um, uh, basically the chronostratigraphy of the Orange Basin is mostly of post-drift sediments, uh, also known as drift sediments after the opening of the South Atlantic. And um, my study area, this is just showing what the sequences uh, I've identified in my stu study area, and you can see they correlate very well with uh, those that have been um, identified in previous studies of the orange uh, basin stratigraphy. So uh, what are deep water hold and thrust faults? I explained first in the previous or the first slide. Um, basically, they are a linked tripartite system due to gravitational uh, collapse. So in the upper uh, domain or closer to the uh, shelf, you'll have the extensional domain, um, which is comprised of lystric growth faults that uh, dip seawards. And uh, due to this uh, faulting, lystric uh, faulting, it leads to down dip compression, um, which is where you have your fold and thrust faults actually forming. And what's actually not known a lot of is the central transitional domain, because it's very structurally complex of like what is actually happening between the two domains. So a lot of is known of the um, up-dip extensional domain because it's closer to the shelf, so easier to um, uh, basically study. And a lot is also known of the compressional domain because uh, the anticlines of distal folds are known to be associated with uh, hydrocarbons. But not a lot is known of the translation domain, which is what we aim to also see what's happening in this study. So the aim is to 
examine the structural relationship between the uh, uh, translational domain and the compressional domain, which we see in the study, and to assess how the, these buried domains have affected uh, progressive sedimentation through time. And the main objective is to create a 3D geological model. So uh, the methodology, um, the acquisition and processing were done by other teams on behalf of Shell. So the, these are the acquisition parameters. Uh, they were conducted on board the Polar Duchess Express, and then the processing was carried out by uh, the Netherlands processing team. And the seismic data set that I have is basically what I worked for um, the interpretation, um, uh, which is, I use Patrol Schlumberger software. And basically an interpretation that's identifying these high amplitude um, uh, reflectors. And these are basically my main geological events or surfaces um, uh, through time. So, and also by identifying um, displacements in the uh, sedimentary layers, which are faults. <laughs> So uh, my full interpretation, I mean, from loading the seismic data to applying volumetric attributes to enhance certain features that would otherwise not be uh, seen in the normal da data set and uh, to horizon mapping, fault mapping, um, then applying the horizon-based uh, attributes, uh, uh, depth conversion and creating my 3D geological model. So my results and discussion, um, overall, I picked over 500 faults, but there's many faults in the study area, like many, many. These are more like first order faults, the really large ones. Um, and all this blue that you're seeing here are basically all the faults um, uh, that I can see in this section. And these are the surfaces that I chosen. Um, there are nine uh, stratigraphic uh, surfaces. Um, key stratigraphic surfaces and the domains that are identified are the uh, up dip translational and the down dip compressional domain. We don't have the extensional domain in this data set because it would probably be closer to the shell. So um, this is just a plan view of the structural framework. Um, uh, it was very interesting when we applied the volumetric variance attribute. So variance is basically enhances like edges in the seismic data sets. So in other words, you can visually see uh, faults and where to pick your fault surfaces. Um, so, so this is a time slice, meaning it's a, it's a, it's a plan view, like looking at it from above. Um, and you can see the faults here uh, in the variance. And then this is the faults in plan view as well, but this is just the dip direction. And using these two, I uh, created this overall structural framework plan view where you have your translational domain, which is mostly dominated by normal faults and oblique slip faults. And then you have your down dip compressional domain, which is where you see your thrust faults associated with the folding thrust faults. Um, yeah. And oh, this image is basically to remind you where my study area is, it's this gray area over here. Um, I'll be explaining my stratigraphy in terms of these three sections, um, so a uh, cross line and two inlines. Um, so I'll move on ahead. So this is a cross line and it basically very well images the fold and thrust faults in um, the study area. Uh, what you have images mostly the compressional domain. Um, this is just the interpretation. So um, underlying this main fold and thrust fault system, it's between the uh, Tyronean to late companion sediments is when uh, thrusting or yeah, down the thrusting uh, uh, or gravitational deformation basically occurred. And underneath you have like smaller scale fold and thrust faults, which shows that there'll probably um, some downslope movements like before the Albion, before the Tyronean um, around the Albion. Um, and then, yeah, basically you can see in this uh, translational domain that you have a lot of complicated faults that are happening compared to the down dip compressional domain. Um, 
this is just a 3D image. Um, so this horizon here is my Syntonian, which is the crest of my fold and thrust belts. And this is just showing the dip angle of it. And um, uh, uh, basically the, the, the demarcation of the translational and the compressional domains. Uh, this is just a zoomed in portion showing that there's folding and thrusting happening underneath the main deep water fold and thrust belts. Uh, this is an inline uh, section. So this section um, is mostly through the down dip uh, compressional domain. So it's mostly like a long strike. And uh, what's interesting over here is that see how the underlying structure has affected the sea floor. So you see this major syncline over here, it's, it's basically resulted in a major slump spell on the sea surface. So you can see that fault reactivation through time and slumping. Uh, uh, this is another section. It's just showing uh, uh, the translational domain uh, along strike. And you can see that it's mostly uh, normal faults in the region. And of interesting in this section is that you have this large canyon. I don't know if you can see it, but this large canyon, um, which we inter interpreted to be up in sea levels uh, that's seen in the Oligocene. However, it's kind of controversial because they say it's below the shelf break and other arguments say that no, it wasn't, et cetera. Um, another interesting surface is the Smyrcene. I don't know if you can see these smaller channels on top, but I'll explain them in the coming sections. Um, yeah, and you can see basically this canyon, how it's associated with uh, the faults uh, underneath in the, in the underlying um, deep water fold and thrust belt system. So um, if I go back to my structural framework, um, you have your normal and oblique slip folds in the active translational domain, right? Um, all these up here. And they dip 50 to 70 degrees um, on average, so quite high dips, and they strike northeast to southwest for the most part. And what's interesting is like, then you have your thrust faults in the uh, compressional domain that strike northwest to southeast, and they dip 25 to 40 degrees northeast on average. Um, these images are just showing. Uh, um, the difference along strike um, of uh, each individual fault. For instance, the thrust faults, you can see that they have um, lower dip angles, for instance, at dip compared to at, at their height. And this is uh, also uh, the uh, image of the oblique slip faults. Um, what's interesting to note is that the oblique slip faults actually cross cuts the uh, thrust fault uh, formation. So you uh, have this almost like, um, if you think of uh, strike slip uh, regions, like, I don't know, like the San Andreas thoughts or something like that, that's basically in small scale, uh, what we see over here between the thrust faults and the um, oblique slip faults. Um, so this is the Oligocene horizon. Um, if you saw in the previous slide, it's basically showing the major canyon that formed um, towards the north. And it was formed by the, the downslope erosion of turbidity currents, which is what we generally know. Um, and so this dotted line is the dem demarcation of the translational and the compressional domains. And this is just showing the, trans uh, the transport di direction of the canyon. It's actually pretty large if you see um over here almost like 1200 well 12 kilometers long of what we can see um in this particular study um what's very interesting in the study i didn't quite expect to find is on the miocene horizon you have these sinusoidal overlapping channels like much smaller in size and these are parallel to the transport direction. So they can't have been formed by your usual downslope 
movement of turbidity currents, but rather by um, the along slope interaction of ocean currents. Um, so uh, basically, this area is about a 14 kilometer zone, um, wide zone of uh, this uh, erosional process happening. And this was formed by the erosive interaction of the uh, southward flowing North Atlantic deep water and the northward fl flowing Antarctic intermediate water currents. Um, and these currents basically intersect at the same, um, they intersect at the same depth, which is where you find um, these, uh, the erosive, these, these er eroded channels on my Miocene horizon uh, between 1,000 to 200 uh, to 1,500 meter water depths. So um, basically a really brief evolution all of this is that um, first uh, between the Albion to Turonian, um, with the opening of the South Atlantic, it led to well-defined shelf slope in a basal plain environments. And then you started having much smaller scale deep water folding thrust faults that formed. And then during the Turonian to Centonian, there was like a large influx of sediment into the Orange Basin and um, along a dipping slope. So this resulted in the uh, spectacular formation of these deep water fold and thrust spots that are observed throughout Southwest uh, Africa. And um, basically gravitational collapse formed oblique slip folds. And then if you continue on ahead, um, more of these oblique slip folds formed, which uh, um, segmented the thrust streaks along strike. Um, and then in the Oligocene, you basically had a major sea level form with margin uplift, mm -hmm. and this led to a major canyon forming. And in the Miocene, then uh, you have, um, due to the formation of the North Atlantic deep water and the Antarctic intermediate water currents, they formed at around 11 million years. And uh, the interaction of these two currents together with the Bunguela current, which intensified at around 11 million years, um, all of this led to the erosive um, features that you see on the Miocene, um, recognized throughout other literature of the Orange Basin. Um, and then uh, present day, you just have slumping on the seafloor, um, which is, you can see has been influenced by the underlying structure and stratigraphy um, from previous, previous uh, processes in the Orange Basin. So for more information, please read our paper in Solid Earth. Uh, this is the first paper that um, uh, I produced. And otherwise, there's lots of more work that I won't go into detail now, but hopefully in a future geo talk of the second paper that um, is under review at the moment, um, basically dealing with the hydrocarbon potential of the basin, which is not what I really covered in the first paper. So we look at um, these natural gas and fluid escape features such as pop marks. You see like extensively on this one surface called the Lake Companion. You also see it on the sea floor. Um, so this is, uh, these are images of the seafloor. This is an image of the Lake Companion surface. All these dots that you see here are basically um, the over 800 pockmarks we've identified in the study area. And this is just a zoomed in portion. Um, other features include like a ex very extensive mud volcano. Um, it's literally like over three kilometers long. It's an elongated mud volcano. It's situated along the axis of um, an anticline of the, the deep water fold and thrust faults. It's actually at the intersection of both the translational and the compressional domains, but I won't go into detail over here. Um, and then we have uh, your high amplitude reflector packages, which are basically indicating the presence of hydrocarbons. Um, yeah, so these are just some various uh, um, some various uh, attributes that have been applied to enhance these uh, hydrocarbons within the study area. Um, 
Yes, otherwise you're on my acknowledgements and thank you for listening to my talk. <laughs> One thing to mention is that after number suspend three is picking the thoughts by hand, we realized in two hours we could do it with machine learning. Mm -hmm. So she's actually working on another paper on machine learning. She can actually for predicting these pop marks as well as these four systems. Thank you, Nombuso. Uh, quick questions. Uh, a lot of discussion points. Okay, let's slide 18. Um, you can see it seems to be interpreted correctly that all the Information of the poles of plus to play the five on the B, I'm thinking like the five in the years, because that's the the middle of the major plus two. Um can you think if they're not being plus cyclic reactive, if any length of poles from the protocols, is there anywhere in the world right now that all the plus work that health is is forming like that? Because I'm expecting it's easy to size the Currently now. Currently, yes, exactly. Um, actually happening. I feel like it's a process that takes quite a long time, like between 93 to 77 million years or, or rather, yeah, is, so I wouldn't be able to say in terms of it's happening now, what it would look like, because it would be on a much, I mean, maybe it would be like incrementally small, not like, because this, all of this folding and thrusting happened between the Turonian and the Lake Companion, which is a very large magnitude of time. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I actually don't know modern day analog because this would take such a long time to actually occur. That's right. And then there was another question, Chris. Yeah, um, most of them, what's the used to model the results of the Oh, um, so I'm using a software called Petrol, um, provided by Schlumberger. And in the software, you basically pick, you, you picking, uh, I wish I can show you how you pick, but you pick basically your fault surfaces um, per, per inline or cross line section. And basically from those pits, you then input, input it into your, um, uh, creating a fault framework and then in the fault framework creates the surfaces for you but it's based on the interpretations that you have made but what's interesting about this um, third paper that we're currently working on is that machine learning can do it for you so I suppose there's less bias in the whole machine learning compared to my manual interpretation which takes forever and then some so yeah so just a, a quick question about the um time time you showed no overlapping channel. Any thoughts on dominance in there? Uh no, it's way too deep. Um <clears throat> in terms of sediment dispersal from the orange river, like diamondiferous sediments and stuff, it would mostly be shallow. Um, so you'd have, yeah, this is way too deep. You'd it'd mostly be coastal and shallow marine, but this is way too deep in order for diamonds to be found out there. Yeah, because it's too heavy to be transported that far. Again, thank you, Numbosa, and a big round of applause for Numbosa. We're waiting. We're waiting. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. Coffee break. Five minutes.
So thank you for your it should be the you just say we can see what are you sure yeah Moral. Let's try again. Mm -hmm. Do you have a you have to get to my computer then? But you have I'm gonna press it, okay, but something yeah, but, yeah, but I can just uh, uh yeah, something uh, are you using an album? No. But then uh, I can yeah, yeah, I think so. But my computer got a little funny. Mm -hmm. oh, this one, isn't it? Yeah. It's dragging now. I can stop it because then I think it was something funny on me. I can't. It's very big also. Oh, yeah. Let's give it some time. Well, I can start my computer then. <laughs> Okay, let's try again. Just I try the copy. Okay. Sometimes it works better if you copy. That's running off of this one, right? Yes. Yeah, so we can take them. <laughs> Also, Oh yeah, we have it. We have it. Stephanie? Yeah. Stephanie, see? Yeah, but there's no trick. Just something missing. Yeah, there's some pictures missing. What? <laughs> <laughs> 
And then I don't know how to tell if it's um if it's recording. Yeah. Oh, maybe there again. Oh, is it still okay? Okay, so we just have to remember to share, right? Yeah. So I go get the intro. Well, that was it should be Thank you. 
Do you need another battery? No, I think it's fine. I'll just put in a new one. Yeah. 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 The problem is that control panel is not working. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to twist the control panel. Yeah, I'm trying to try plugging it in. But now we have to plug into the. So I want to copy onto the. You didn't have to. Just a sub period for. This window is E. So just the. Okay, is this the one on the USB now? The USB. This is the one. Yeah. No, no, no. Is this the one you just copied? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, without the control panel, I don't think we can switch to the left. You can try, yeah, it doesn't seem to repair it right now. And the problem is normally we do this, but we have to have this control panel working to tell it to do this. Like first time ever I've seen this not work. So what was wrong with the it before? Oh, oh, because okay, 
Yeah, but it, it because the links don't work with that computer. So yeah, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to get yeah. Let's just figure out where the U.S. Yeah, I think the U the the CMI or whatever is going into the um projector. No, into the projector. We don't care about the computer. Yeah, we want to just connect this to the boat. Wait, right. Mm -hmm. oh. that in now. Okay. Go ahead. But then it's not going to Okay. Okay, but now we're on the Zoom call. Yes, I think the Zoom call is running on this machine. Right, so now we have to run the Zoom call over here. Yeah. Okay. So the no, that's your computer. Yeah, that should have no, but but with the um, right. So she needs to do the login from Grant Bybee. Yeah, but we're on your computer now. This is your computer. No, that's why I'm saying we can just flip back to Oh, okay. <laughs> Can't share the screen something? It's an extension. I don't think so. Okay, maybe let's just switch back and let people like I can check it out. I joined in there. Did you let me in and share my screen? Oh, okay. Say so tell let's tell people what's happening. Oh, just click here. All right. Yeah, and expand. Yeah. Hi, um, hi everyone. We're just having a few technical difficulties. We'll be online shortly. We're just going to share the um screen from the laptop. So give us a few minutes. Great everything.
then you can talk about them. So she's very good here. There we go. Yeah. 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 This is why we hired. <laughs> okay, so we find an English. Oh, so um, yeah, all good. Okay. Okay, sorry, we're going to go find technical difficulties. Since our control panel is out on the um, basket board, um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Stephanie Turner from the um, University of Oslo at the moment. Formerly, uh, Steve was the, the last um, incarnation of a center of excellence, and now they move on to FAB, which stands for Planetary Urban Analysis. And I'll let Stephanie introduce herself. Um, we've been working with um, both Tom and Stephanie for, gosh, I don't know, a long time. I've been visiting that 25 years. So. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> She's much younger than me. <laughs> So I really appreciate them um, taking the time and money and the effort to come here and, and celebrate with me and also to help with the physical property. I'm very excited. Okay, thank thanks a lot for the introduction. Thank you a lot for your patience to wait for this talk. Um, and it is taking from quite far away Earth to other Earths. And extra Earth is the short term for that, which is planets which circle in other planetary systems around this different star. And I will introduce you to that in short, but briefly, so you know a little bit about my background. So I grew up in that. You need to put it in my Thank you for the Always ignore the microphone. Thank you. No, my, my mic is muted. Oh, yeah. Uh, my cameras so which let's try this mm -hmm. okay do you hear me better now i think i hope so anyway <clears throat> so briefly to introduce myself uh, um yes okay good yes, thank you uh so i have studied geophysics originally and my master thesis was about an impact crater in finland which i studied by magnetics and gravity which uh, was measured on an icy lake and the magnetic part was measured on a, from an um, aircraft. So already then I started to lift off myself a little from the surface and went on then to other planetary surfaces and continued studying craters. And uh, now um, I will introduce you to our latest adventure or venture, which is called Center for Planetary Habitability. Uh, the part which uh, is starting uh, to look for habitable planets in other solar systems. And uh, the Earth part you will hear on Thursday about. So if we talk about uh, habitability, uh, the astronomers define habitability with the, uh, similar to Earth, the fact that we have um, presence of uh, liquid surface water, meaning you have a temperature range between zero and 100 degree roughly, so that humans or other creatures can live. What is uh, the major challenge, and we know that from Earth as well, is that we have a planet which um, starts without life and then arrive in conditions which make maybe cyanobacteria and then grow uh, more and more habitable thing, uh, or objects or an animals which inhabited uh, surface or first water. And we saw a little bit of paleontology already earlier today. And what we want to address is um, quite a few open questions, which um, what is the conditions which make a planet habitable? Uh, and then this a little bit more hospitable and inhabited. So how life forms? Not exactly, but what are the conditions in which life could uh, evolve? And we know from the solar system that Earth is the only planet which has guaranteed life on uh, the surface. So how is it about the other planets in the solar system? And what do we do when we go to other uh, planetary systems around other stars? And to illustrate a little bit the, um, the uh, 
time dependence of uh, habitability is you see this blue band of now whatever color is which is a marked habitable zone and you see the in the bottom uh, 70 percent that was at the sun's birth the brightness compared to today so we had a much weaker sun uh, which uh, by the definition of surface temperature on the planet very surface we have uh, venus which is closer to the sun uh, in the habitable zone but when we reach to 4.6 billion years later into today, when we have our current sun strengths, then we see that the Earth has moved into habitable zone and Venus has been in the hot area while Mars is still in the cold part of the solar system. And when we go in the future by about 2 billion years more, then we reach um, the, probably a conditions which has happened in the past on Venus. So we lose all our water and maybe we do accelerate it as humans a little more, but uh, from the sun it alone, it is only predicted for 2 billion years from now. So what happens then is a question of uh, modeling, but uh, we can work with this uh, simple definition of what is habitability. So obviously, um, the prospect of life beyond Earth has captivated humankind for centuries. And we, of course, want to ask these questions, what makes a planet habitable? Why is the Earth the only planet with life in the solar system? And then if you compare the two objects, Earth, which have a lot of uh, features, and many of these you have uh, used for studying uh, earlier today, and uh, other planets. So the main difference is Earth has a magnetic field, uh, formed by a geodynamo, which most of the other objects or Earth-like planets don't have. We have an inner solid core, which we only can uh, understand by seismic uh, measurements. We have um, unlikely life on all the other planets. So that's another uh, specific of the Earth. The other thing is uh, plate tectonics and the possibility to recycle material into the interior by subduction. And obviously surface water, uh, so we can then have by the rock cycle and the water cycle through the interior and the atmosphere, say we have a climate, we have atmosphere, we have life, we have water and all these specific things which are um, peculiar. Uh, so, but what else may, beside the long-lived magnetic field or not to forget the moon, which stabilized the um, spin axis into a specific angle, and could be um, criteria for, for making a planet habitable. And how do we understand if that is true for other um, objects? So, and did our closest uh, sister planet Venus ever reach the conditions of uh, life to begin with because it left the habitable zone very early on? And would any of them in the future, because Mars has, if you've seen in the previous slide, might enter in the habitable zone, but is enough water there to actually, or is there anything there which can produce uh, organic um, molecules which then form life? Or do we just reawake something because Mars had water on the surface long time ago? And then if we put it into other planetary systems far away from the sun, how do we recognize these other objects if they are habitable? So the other aspect I pointed briefly out is that habitability is time dependent. And you see on the uh, left side, um, a lot of uh, things which happen on Earth, like impact volcanism, kimberlite formation, our presence, uh, change in the magnetic field, change in the planet orbit or Milankovitch cycle, large igneous provinces, and they have all time uh, repetition time scales and uh, duration time scales. And all these, rates and the temporal um, context are essential of what is important potentially for um, uh, making a planet habitable or keeping a planet habitable. So when we look at Mars, I briefly already said, it is currently in a, or has been early on moved into a permanent ice house. So conditions which are uh, very inhospitable uh, so could life have began there very early on? And even though we don't understand it fitting in the concept of habitability, 
what has happened there. And of course, a lot of Mars missions go there to pick up samples, not only to study the rocks, which we think maybe is more exciting, but uh, also to find little bacteria corpses in the samples they return. Then from the Earth, we know from plate reconstructions um, that a lot of things has happened. And we just heard in the Devonian uh, South Africa was on the South Pole, uh, obviously more frozen than today. Uh, so what of this um, plate motion and uh, dramatic climate changes have an effect on the um, biodiversity? We heard earlier more about mass extinction, but actually also the opposite effect is uh, observed. And when we then go to exoplanets, um, we know that they change or lose the atmosphere, just like in our solar system, uh, Mercury has no atmosphere, uh, Venus is totally um, hellish hot, and um, Earth is just about right. And uh, in Mars, we don't really know what is going on, if it will be or was habitable. So when we talk about um, this diagram again, and we start at the, the solar system birth in the bottom, uh, we know that water has been delivered there by probably the building stones uh, of uh, planet formation. So um, they have been brought there very early on. So the likelihood of water being present on the surface of Earth is um, predicted, not certain. And the same should be for all the other terrestrial planets because they are formed roughly from the same material. So, but under planet formation, the actually first atmosphere, primary atmosphere, is what is the gas which is in the planet formation uh, uh, process, the gas which is uh, present. And that is hydro hydrogen and helium in pure form. That's the main building stones of the sun and also of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. So they kept their original atmosphere while we uh, left uh, to a different atmosphere, fortunately to us. So that is called the secondary um, atmosphere, which is formed by volcanism. And uh, you can have uh, in the beginning this magma ocean when you think that when we consider the entire planet molten and then slowly cooling down, degassing and uh, producing secondary atmosphere, which is mostly formed of greenhouse gases. So dominantly by uh, methane, CO2 and whatever comes out of a volcano. So that means that we have a, a CO2 dominated atmosphere from very early on, 70 to 80% on all planets. Uh, on half time, about 2.5 billion years ago, uh, the CO2 has been already, or at least for some, uh, predicted to be reduced because in, on Earth, we know it is quite strongly full of nitrogen. So somewhere this uh, has been uh, in the atmosphere already for long. So then on Earth, total different um, evolution is that we have uh, the um, upcoming of cyanobacteria already 3.6 uh, um, uh, billion years ago, which start to photosynthesize and produce oxygen in the atmosphere, which then um, in 4 billion years ago at, at the great excitation event um, have uh, produced so much uh, oxygen that it is measurable. And it took then quite a while uh, into uh, later on neoproterozoic um, oxygenation event when I guess the trees started producing or helped produce oxygen as well. So a lot of things has happened on Earth and that is all related to the formation of life which changed the atmosphere completely. So that we then have um, uh, left only 0.04% of uh, CO2 uh, from compared to what has uh, been there in the beginning. So if we look at uh, Venus, Venus uh, may have begun very position, as I said, in the habitable zone, spot on, and liquid water has been present there, but already very close, and it was very close, there was a CO2 dominated atmosphere, and we know all these greenhouse gases um, probably went straight on an abiotic path. So we probably have no chance to evolve life there. And then 
Um, even if water may have been abundant there, it lost uh, all to space quite early on due to the runaway greenhouse gas, which we talk about also for uh, today, at least the greenhouse effect. And um, we ended up with a very dry atmosphere, although the atmosphere is uh, 100 times almost thicker than uh, the one of the Earth, but it is dominated by CO2. So what we then have, if we compare early uh, Venus and uh, late Venus, we have a planet which is full of CO2 in the atmosphere, super hot, uh, acid rain, and um, no water, almost no water in the atmosphere, compared to Earth, which has entered into the most uh, prolific uh, period only 750 million years ago. So maybe Venus never ever had the chance to uh, generate life on its surface or becoming even uh, hospitable. So what is the difference in their evolution? Is it just the distance uh, to the sun? So if we talk about Mars, we have uh, on the surface record, so I forgot to say Venus surface is only roughly 500 million years old. So roughly the time when um, uh, Earth became super populated with um, all kinds of life forms. Um, also we have the entire circle back to the beginning of the solar system. So we find that at some point in 3.7 billion years ago, the oceans which could have been there and the dynamo has ended and probably a few hundred, a few, few hundred million years later, um, also the, the um, atmosphere thinned out to a lot. So we have um, surface record of um, Mars once being much wetter because we see river deltas and we see um, sediments and we see uh, phyllosilicates, all related to weathering on the surface. So it lost it all when it lost the magnetic field and that is about 3.7 billion years ago and it cooled down very much because also the atmosphere got thinner and thinner. So there was probably no chance of having life at all. And that means that we have a transition from early uh, Mars to uh, late today's Mars, where we have uh, still an atmosphere of 95% of um, CO2, uh, but it is only uh, a hundredth of the current Earth's atmosphere in, in thickness. So coming back to these uh, steps, um, from the primary atmosphere uh, over the secondary atmosphere, then on the th third atmosphere, which is, um, as you see, Venus stuck on 97% CO2 and uh, Mars on 95, while Earth transited into this uh, 0 0.04 by uh, um, carbonate formation and oxygenation, and that only exists on the Earth. So we have a very peculiar uh, geological evolution for the planet Earth. So how do we uh, see it from space? And that is usually the spectroscopy, and this is uh, the, the spectra for um, Venus on top, uh, Earth in the middle, and Mars on the bottom. You see the strong CO2 component in all of them, and then Earth looks different, which is indicator for water, uh, zone and of course the CO2, which is even in a trace uh, component visibly very much. So we can use um, spectral methods to study um, atmospheric signatures, which could be related to a life, um, or also by planets many, many um, light years away. And we know that the life has been a fundamental influence uh, on Earth's history, both in geology and on the atmosphere. So how can we use that? First thing is we have to recognize that actually, even though we call it the blue planet, um, it is extremely little water. So we have on the surface spread roughly 70%. But if we look at volume and you see the two balls up there on the um, stripped uh, earth on the right, 
uh, it's only 0.12% of volume. And if you talk in mass, it's 0.02%. So extremely little water actually available. And it can be lost very easily. And if that's the essential for life, uh, then we are on not thin ice, but um, not much water at least. So there has been then exoplanets and I come back to exoplanets and all the details in a little in short. So if we talk about habitability, is it only about water or do we need much more? So if you look at this um, planet to the right, which is only imagination, but it is an uh, object which is twice the size of the earth. And it is uh, discovered by Kepler too. Uh, and it's called 18b because it's the star 18 and it's the first planet on uh, this uh, star 18 of the Kepler mission. And it has a totally impressive spectrum. So you see these uh, black uh, points and then a lot of models. And in the models, it suggests that this atmosphere has uh, water, uh, vapor, clouds, and um, real clouds in the atmosphere. So there is water. So is this object, which is called super Earth, habitable or not? What do we need more? So that was uh, one of the critical things. If you have water in the atmosphere, is it enough or not? Maybe you have followed the um, uh, news, uh, science news uh, a few years ago, where they claim to have detected the phosphine, which is pH 3 in the atmosphere. And the big news was, is there life on Venus? Because this phosphine is detected in the clouds, which are in 50 kilometer height. And these ones may have about the temperature, which is suitable for liquid water and blah, blah, blah. So was there, um, and the fact why they call this actual poison uh, as a um, uh, sign of life, it is because it is, uh, it, biodegrading or out of biodegradation uh, form gas. So if you have a lot of corpses flying in the skies, then uh, you may have uh, this phosphine as a byproduct. So the main point is they couldn't explain in the uh, rates of a chemical network in the atmosphere, why there should be so much phosphine. So the main argument for life is that there's a chemical disequilibrium, so it's extra produced and it's not in, in a um, balance. So obviously in the diagram, so you see the top diagram is not very impressive, but the lower one is then all, all the work, everyone was showing that this measurement was just the creation of uh, good will and wishes. So there is no phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, at least not currently, so who knows? So there was then the complaint or um, uh, uh, statement, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, which wasn't there. But what the effect was is straight after three Venus missions were granted. So money machine. It's not about the phosphine or life. It's about claiming life could be there allows then the big space agencies to invest money. So, but what else can we do? It is, um, we can use these atmosphere biosignatures of exoplanets uh, to study whether there is life. So it's not only water we need, we need also to have ozone or oxygen and a lot of things to be detected. So you see in the first column, the um, ingredient, uh, because for example, CO2 and methane coexisting means that the methane is produced and not immediately returned into CO2 and water. So there is a disequilibrium, which tells you that there's a process which generates a lot of things. Can be natural, but can be also by farting cows. And we have a lot of these kind of uh, chemical systems, which allow this kind of disequilibrium and conditions which are very hot in the atmosphere and so on. You see all these uh, little notes on the top, which uh, uh, gives, um, false positive in the atmosphere because there's natural processes, what we call natural, we are also natural, but the, the, the geological process which allow to produce similar features like uh, uh, life produces. So there's a challenge now to be confident 
about the mm, detection if they are real uh, life products or if they are chemical reaction which in specific conditions allows to form. So one of the main things which on Earth, and that is already exoplanet studies, uh, to understand all these weird conditions in which uh, the same chemical products like oxygen or ozone or so on form, which could be geological processes, which we're just not familiar on Earth because we have the conditions we have. So now, what is an exoplanet? And I introduced this check, which is planet alike, circling around. And if we look at the next slide. And if we try to find exoplanets now, they are some in the glare of this um, lighthouse or Okay, so you have a, uh, a firefly in the in near the light bulb of this lighthouse, and that is so difficult, so you would never recognize this one. So you have to have specific conditions. And a few occasions, and this is moving, so you see we have several, uh, 15 or 10 or so years, observing these little white balls moving around, and that is, a photo of four exoplanets circling the star called HR 8799. And it took quite a while for observing because the further away, the longer it takes until they move, like um, uh, for the Earth takes one year. And if we wait for Jupiter to move, it takes 12 years around the sun. So they are extremely far away from the star. Okay, so how do we observe exoplanets? And there's quite a lot of methods. So the one which you just saw is direct imaging, where you see them far away when the star is not disturbing any longer and uh, the planets move around. Then there's an astrometric method, which is meaning that the star is wobbling because this planet which is disturbing is making it wobble when it goes around. So you have uh, gravity and helping. Um, then you have microlensing, it's again some gravity and it's very rare. So you have to have a constellation where the star or the planet is behind another object and it makes the light band so that you one, at one uh, event you can uh, detect uh, the, the constellation star planet observed. Very rare and you see almost no of these uh, dots is microlensing. And um, the next one is radial velocity. That is uh, what do you know from Doppler shift, uh, at least uh, all those who do with uh, spectral measurements. Um, the, the, the effect of, uh, again, planet and um, a star moving together when the planet goes around, you, the, the, um, the movement of the star is slightly wobbling and you see then the blue shift and the red shift on the wobble. Uh, that is one of the ways to detect um, planets which are quite massive. And the next, the last method, which is uh, for most uh, discoveries, is the transit method, which is when the star, when a planet passes in front of a star. And then timing variations is when you use this transit, and there are multiple planets, and they when they move together, they shift each other, so you're. Uh, appearance of the planet is slightly wobbling around as well, and that is also detection. So you see the radial velocity and the uh, uh, transit method in red and green are the ones which are the most efficient discovery methods. So that's how a transit looks like, and you can, uh, that is Mercury, a lot of Mercury's, not that, uh, so uh, in 2006, and now I have to, so the next one, you can observe in 12th or 11th of November in uh, 2032. So most of you will manage. Um, so then Venus transit 
It's another object which you can see from Earth. It's um, happened last time in uh, 2012, but there I think none of us will manage because the next one is in December 2117. Wow. So, uh, I, I, I don't know if, uh, but anyway. So you see that's very rare occasions when you want to watch it from Earth uh, and look into the sun just so that the constellation and the uh, orbital planes are aligned well. But at least uh, you can, uh, you have many of the other smaller uh, dark. The, the, that's the challenge of observing in transits. It's uh, the stars have uh, uh, sunspots and they are due to the magnetic field generation in the, um, in the suns or stars. And the more often you have these uh, black dark spots, they are less regular than the transit. So they are false positives. And you need to also think about them when you find your transit uh, in the detection. So some challenges, but it works still fine. So there's a lot of um, spacecrafts already. So Coro was the first one which was dedicated to transit measurements and helioseismology. So seismic, uh, the, the convection pattern of the star gives you the age of the star. Kepler has uh, discovered the most so far. Gaia is a general telescope and also Schwitzer and Hubble Space Telescope, all of these which look at stars for longer than a few seconds are potential discoverers of exoplanets by a pure transit method. Cheops is uh, running still, TESS is relatively new. Um, James uh, uh, Webb Space Telescope, also now spectrograph, will observe the atmospheres. Plato to be launched soon to be transit measurements and Ariel also spectrograph. So there will be a lot of opportunities of finding um, exoplanets and looking at their atmospheres. So then coming back um, to this diagram, you saw yesterday there were 5,322 exoplanets confirmed. And when you look again at this, so the transit measure, this is the green part. It, um, if you um, see in the bottom, it's the period in days. So if you go to um, the red lines, that's where Earth is and the mass and Jupiter mass, uh, so Earth, would not be discovered with the current methods. But Jupiter objects, the blue cross is, um, or the one which is top uh, right. So Jupiter's, you would find a lot with radio velocity methods. The blue stars are the ones um, which are by direct imaging. So they are extremely far away from the star. And then the green ones, they are the transit because the telescope is looking only three months into one direction and you have to be very fast to be twice visible in three months. So you're very, very close up. And that's the difficulty. So everything which is in the uh, lower right corner is currently not discoverable. And um, the Plato mission will do stare into for two years into one direction. So they hope to find uh, Earth like objects, at least objects in Earth-like orbits, so which takes one year to at least come back once. So in the very beginning, when you look at the number of planets and roughly the size, uh, and that is in radius, so you can see that we have these uh, Earth objects, very few, and then we have uh, Neptune, uh, Jupiter, and so on, also very few. And the majority of objects discovered were in the size between um, Earth and Neptune. So we had a very peculiar collection of uh, planets. So which of these, the small uh, ones may be like Earth or are they funny ones and have never been like Earth? So out of this, how do I do with time? Okay, so out of this, uh, astronomers make a diagram like this, and that is in the bottom, uh, mass in Earth's masses and radius uh, uh, um, in Earth's radius. And you can see from the top right, you come 
uh, from the star side into uh, objects which are larger than or uh, around Jupiter size, and then into Neptune, and then into the Earth-like objects. And you can see that um, S star scale nicely in a double logarithmic scale as a power law. Also, Jovian words nicely scale with power law, meaning that they have all something in common, and that's the interior structure uh, which they describe. When you come to Neptunian words, they are icy uh, with a core and um, some kind of also in something in common with uh, interior st structure. And then in the uh, terrestrial planets, and you see it's solar system planets and the moons of the solar system. So it's not really exoplanets yet, but still they claim, and astronomer claims can plot nicely a power law through it. And we all know that's not true. So the, the big fight now is how, how power lawish is the lower range? Because if we have a star, it scales with mass and size is nicely um, double logarithmic. So what to do? Do we, what do we do with these uh, objects between Neptune, mini Neptune, super Earth, Earth and Mars? Do we find a power law for them or not? Or do we expect actually power law if this is made almost from ice and rock and uh, others are made from uh, rock and iron? Should there be a power law? Okay, now we do exoplanet observation. So which one is um, Earth, <laughs> Neptune, or whatever? You don't know, huh? Exactly. So you need a little more, so you're totally blind. No, and that's why the three dots, I don't know if it's international, but the three dots tell you, you cannot say. So you need transit observations for the radius. And then you need the spectral observation where the, um, the wobble uh, of the star tells you the mass of the object. So then you know, for example, if uh, they may be all the same size, but the, the most left one may have uh, uh, five uh, kilogram per cubic meter, like a super Mercury, Earth, no, Mercury has more, but um, Earth then something like five and Neptune something like three. So that helps maybe. So we can define the structure like uh, this. And hopefully we, we are right because actually as a um, earth scientist, you know that um, we have this uh, nice uh, interior structure which we can define core, silicate and crust. And we have examples of these kind of things as iron meteorite or stony meteorite to imagine what these materials are. But when you look at the earth, and you can measure these uh, proportions by seismic velocities. You know also that in the silica block, you have a lot of um, uh, changes in velocity, which are related to um, phase transitions. And that also means that it is not silicate homogeneously, but you also are under its own weight compress the interior. So you need to think about what actual material there is to understand the average velocity, the average density of an object, which you know from um, volume and mass. Uh, so you know the density, but is the structure like this or is it a little shifted and you are just compressing it a lot? So for that, obviously you can use uh, what you know from high pressure physics. You can do numerical modeling, you do, can do experiments. And you're already, again, close to exoplanet studies. So you know your material, you know the temperature in the interior, and you know all these things. So you can derive, and this is not maybe, so again, in the uh, x-axis um, mass and earth masses, and in the y-axis radius. So you see that these curves are not uh, scaled like a volume, uh, growing volume uh, in proportion, but Due to its compression, it is uh, getting on more help, uh, the, the, to reach a certain mass, you need to reach a very large volume because of self-compression. 
effectively uh, radial structure and material density give you um, the uncompressed density and that is far away from what you observe as average density so you need to understand the composition of the object before you actually can say something about the interior structure and that's real geophysics so if we look at a few of these uh, solar systems this uh, effective temperature is the temperature of the sun surface or star surface uh, the solar system, uh, the sun has uh, 5,000, no, um, is drawn in the, in the, where the um, horizontal line is. And the four blobs you see in the edge is uh, Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And the uh, Earth uh, objects uh, are uh, where the red line is, is Earth. Uh, so you see that. All of these objects are much closer in, much, much closer in, uh, in to the sun. So if we want to understand all these things of how, what the interior structure of planet is, you need to think about how planetary systems form. And for that, we have um, only limited um, number of objects because we are very close to the star. So we are in a hot zone. We know the age of the star because of size, uh, helioseismology. We know the type. We know maybe also some element abundances. We maybe know that um, there's uh, planets moving around. For that, we need all these big blobs um, larger than Jupiter. So you see uh, which one I show now. So that is Jupiter. So roughly everything which is bigger is bigger than Jupiter. So, and um, out of that, we can then uh, hopefully understand a little bit about the planetary systems, but also we have in our solar system, Venus and Earth, very similar in size and probably structure and so on and so on, which have completely different atmospheres. So how does that happen? So planetary system formation in a very simplified way is that we have uh, uh, gas dust disk, uh, which forms when the star forms. Then uh, the dust, little particles, which you can recognize still in the uh, carbonaceous chondrite meteorites, which settle in the middle. They form planetesimates, so or what is maybe now asteroids. Uh, they grow to bigger objects in number four. And then um, the icy planets further out, because it's most material. Um, may form uh, the last because it takes a lot of time to the material to accumulate on them. But at a certain point, and you see then um, uh, these two objects uh, collect already the gas from the disk. Uh, that's why Jupiter and Saturn have a similar gas uh, as the star. So what is not in the star is entered to them and maybe on all the uh, planets, as I told you, as the primary atmosphere. So we end up then with the solar system as you shown as shown in the bottom number six row. And when we look at this, okay. Okay, so. Big surprise, um, we have uh, the terrestrial planets, which are rocky with more bigger or smaller iron core. Uh, then we have um, Saturn and Jupiter with uh, gas, big gas envelopes and further out the gas envelope is condensed on the surface. So that's why they're called ice. And there has been a model, which, um, ah, that went faster, which is, um, calculating the distance from the star and the condensation temperature of the material in the disk, which forms the dust and the planetesimals, uh, which allow them to, when you form locally a planet, to put the ingredients in there. So mostly iron close to the sun and the further out, the more icy or volatile rich the object will be. So do we manage to make uh, exoplanet systems in the same way? So if we then um, wait for the next slide, there's uh, chemical uh, measurements which we can do. So we know the composition of the sun from spectral measurements. We know element abundances 
And then we have um, carbonaceous chondroids, which we can match with the elemental abundance. So the uh, star solar abundance is on the left. Then the comparison between uh, carbonaceous chondroid element abundance minus the volatiles is uh, very similar to what we have in the sun. So we are kind of uh, confident about the um, composition or material which we have in the solar system. And then to the very uh, right, we have what is called condensation sequence. And you see um, the complicated chemical uh, uh, descriptions which are related to the um, y-axis in temperature. So depending on temperature, you get different materials and uh, this can be incorporated into the uh, plants. And then what you do next is uh, make uh, n-body simulations, meaning you model what I showed you in this uh, six steps uh, in numerical simulations. You assume that planet formation um, via compositional sorted planetesimal accretion is a way of forming plan planet systems. And um, then numerical simulation helps you to make this, for example, three steps where you have in the first one a lot of planetesimals. They uh, hit each other and uh, aggregate to larger objects. And you see that in the interior, they are bigger and further out, they come together. And what you cannot see because it's not a movie is that these objects grow from outside and then move slowly inwards. So you actually accumulate material from a little further out. So do we manage to produce uh, planets? We hope so, but we are not fully there yet. So that's the early um, solar system we know, hopefully, but a lot of people fight, but in the Exoplanet systems, it's not so much. So how do we help us? And that is exactly a little bit simplified what helps uh, understand the structure of a planet. So we have uh, the amount of uh, material available and then depending on the um, oxygen fugacity around, we know how much uh, iron or actually uh, iron in the silica portion uh, could exist. And if we have the same with the hydrogen fugacity, we know also how much uh, water may be in the atmosphere. So that is then uh, the closer to the sun on the top and the further away with different um, oxygen and hydrogen um, or more complicated, but roughly like this, we can produce. And with that, you also do uh, in change in average density from the uh, super iron rich one to the most um, ice uh, carrying one um, on top. And if you are on this outermost column, you might lose all the volatiles because you're too close to the um, sun of that system. And that is because um, if we are too hot, five minutes, okay, I think I should be done. So if we're too hot, um, we are heating up the atmosphere so that the molecules in the atmosphere are moving a lot around. And um, as you can see, not very well, unfortunately. So there's uh, kind of like, like these lines saying if we have um, temperatures in the bottom, so if we have certain temperatures, we manage to um, heat specific types of molecules in the atmosphere. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are big enough that they can keep hydrogen and uh, also helium. Earth can keep water in the atmosphere if it is not too hot, but currently it's in the same, in the area where it is not losing too much uh, into space. And uh, the larger the molecules in the atmosphere, the more difficult it is to move them away. So that is the main principle and that's called um, or minimum mass criteria to keep the atmosphere. So we have seen this already. Now it's shown period and how hot the sun is. And all these transiting objects are extremely close to the um, sun, like less than uh, 100 days usually. And all the radial velocity objects are roughly in the Earth's environment. So what does it tell us? That when we look at um, the, these uh, interior uh, curves, as we have seen before, 
we have to think about uh, the closeness to the sun when we do calculate the interior diagrams. And when we change to the next one, you get the color of the stars and the um, more red they are, the hotter they are. So it's almost impossible to have in this red, red uh, dots uh, objects which have any volatile in them. So that is an additional information which we can use distance from the star. Okay, maybe I'm a little... So we can observe the atmospheres during transit. And that is because when it is in front of the star, it makes it a little dimmer. When it enters behind or it goes around the star, it is actually emitting through, through the... So it's a shine on from the star so that it is reflecting maybe. And so we have several ways of measuring atmosphere. Uh, so that there's a few um, diagrams already given and we see that each of these planets, bigger and smaller, all of them have different type of atmosphere. So do you think atmosphere will help us or not? But do we... Not sure? I, I'm, I, I'm on the not sure side. So if we compare, for example, Venus and Earth, same size, same blah, 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 everything similar from, from an astronomer perspective and totally different, yeah? So, and it is, and then there's the two type of Jupiter also to indicate the, the, the composition of the atmosphere. Also same planet type, but uh, not necessarily uh, the same chemical and physical identity. So, and um, that is what is then for the future. We can, of course, calculate all these uh, lines, like how cold or warm has the surface of the planet to be, to keep which volatiles and how far away. So we have these hot Jupiters, you can say, no volatiles. And then we have <clears throat> something like um, between 1,000 and 1,800, somewhere is the Earth, and so on and so on. And we know also from, from uh, Earth's geological record, we have a warm planet. Sometimes we have ice ages, so we can condense the water on the surface. So maybe we keep it a little longer. But uh, in general, I think the recycling into the uh, mantle is more effective. And we have also other rock, rock records. So Earth can tell us all about uh, change in atmosphere from the rock record. And so that is a very good way of looking backwards in time on a planet which became inhabited by a lot of uh, life forms. That's the most uh, difficult diagram of this um, thing. And that's also the second last. So, and uh, there you have to, so the, the size of the object is um, relative, so Jupiter, Neptune, and uh, the blue ones are like dark blue ones are um, Earth like. Then we have in this color coded uh, the different atmospheres, uh, and that tells you. So if we look in the bottom, it's called flux relative to Earth, meaning that if you are into the red part, it's hotter on the surface of the planet, and in the uh, y axis is the star temperature. So it's different stars, smaller ones and bigger ones, and the bigger ones, of course, are hotter. So you are reaching these um, uh, objects in the orbit of, for example, Venus uh, are on the super hot planets already extremely in danger zone for never ever having a part of the light uh, so, uh, on the surface. And then to the other side, which should show in blue, where it's early mass, there it's cold enough to keep at least condensed atmosphere for longer and maybe then revive uh, later in time. So what we need to think of if we want to become an exoplanet researcher, use all what we learned from us, is uh, habitability must be directed to the search for uh, Earth-like ones into other star planet systems because it's just unlikely that it happened multiple times in the solar system. Um, 
we have the challenge that we observe the same size, but the, which composition, and for that we need to do observation of the atmosphere. And we have all the help of the solar system and the Earth and the study of uh, Earth to figure out and recognize the key conditions of what makes a planet habitable and then predict models. As I show you a very fast overview of a lot of things, how to form planets and which are atmosphere and so on and so on, um, to check which of these conditions actually exist on other planets. And then there's um, exoplanet uh, future um, space missions from U European Space Agency, two examples, uh, Plato and Ariel, and I point them out because after a few short period of where it's proprietary to the team, uh, it is uh, open access data. So it's not that it is uh, limited to only those who are in the teams and they extend teams, you can apply and so on, like almost all space missions. So you can actually help working on this uh, exoplanet detection observation of the physical properties, which are hopefully in the future more than just size and mass. Uh, so that we get more information about the uh, average than just average density. We also have the age of the system through Plato by helioseismology, and that also allows us to see if we have changed the atmosphere through time, because we know how fast it goes on Earth or on Venus. And with that, um, I'm open for questions. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. After a hard start, but yeah. yeah. Okay, do we have questions? Yeah, so if you could identify having to do with the surveillance, what could you do with that? Um, I mean, is there any way that. Win, win the Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, you cannot go there, for example. So we're going to be able to send the probe. No, not with our current, unless you will, but super warp or whatever, then you can do. But why is the search for exoplanets habitable? So considered to be so important. Yeah. Because uh, obviously it's uh, interesting for some to find life somewhere else. So it's interesting to find an answer there, but that's good. Yeah, but that you cannot prove that you have to believe. You get a lot of money. Usually you get a lot of money to do this kind of missions when you call, claim you search for life. But obviously uh, exoplanets, uh, astrobiology, all this stuff is uh, geoscience uh, applied to some other things, which hopefully make not only uh, understand these exoplanets, but uh, also you will learn about, hmm, if I think about it, 2.4 billion years ago, we had a CO2 atmosphere. So definitely my chemical networks don't work as it does today. So my weathering, my uh, atmosphere interaction with the rocks is different. So you have some stuff there, which could be even you excite, ex could even excite you. Yeah. Maybe. Another question. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had a question. Um, so I read recently that there is a there's this possibility of water on the mm -hmm. And for those such cases where the planet is set for the moon is species by the tidal force, then there's not that search for the, the distance away from the source star. I think that uh, search can go away to some. Yeah, so of course, uh, if you go into the interior or in, in um, like for Venus, they claim the habitable zone is in the, in the, in the cloud layer in the 50 kilometer above ground. Uh, for Europa is the example to be in the sub-ocean, but that's even more difficult to prove. So in this sense, yes, there's a lot of things. And you, of course, if you have liquid water somewhere and that's your prime, um, target liquid water, then you have a lot of environments where you have liquid water, but necessarily you need also a little bit organic material, you need the light and you need whatever you need to form life and you still haven't understood completely how to do that. So it's part of it, but 
if you just look for conditions, yes, you find a lot of environments where it is possible, but whether it happened, we don't know. So in this sense, it's uh, more, more choice than just the habitability and astronomy defines. Mm -hmm. And in some way, you will probably be more about actual Earth, Earth life. Okay, you talk about the satellite. You could be like this additional with the satellite on top of it. Can you get obviously Can you get the other question? Can you get the other question? I'm just interested, you said we can turn the age from the helium seismology into effect. So, so the star goes through, as I said in the beginning, it has, is dimmer in the beginning and then gets lighter. So, so the longer the star is active, it get the, the layer of in which convection occurs is moving in the uh, within the interior of the star. And then they measure uh, the eigenmodes of the, um, con which is then reflecting the convection cell size. And that is um, uh, related to star evolution models give you the age. And yes, so it's a lot of models, but partly gives you an age. Yeah, I mean, the age is the most important thing because it's called the planet one. It's too quiet, it's not this way like a CO2, yeah, ozone, and, and water. Okay? You don't know because we have an age. We have had enough of the different proportions of 2.4 billion years. If you don't find out to think about Earth, it could have been you know, halfway through Earth, or is it right now? So, you know, so to know the age, Earth is always a little bit very philosophical. That's in the ancients. I wanted to ask a question about Venus. Perhaps, you know, it's hit by a large object like Earth was to form its moon, but that caused its rotation to be so different, which caused it not to have a magnetic field. I mean, how how close is Venus that if, you know, if it hadn't been hit or if it had been hit just right to make a moon, um, would it be in the habitable zone now? Could be. But if that's the main point, that the moon is stabilizing the, the um, rotation axis, maybe yes, but that's one of the things. So there's a lot of things listed in this, what is important for habitability, meaning also not too much um, uh, climate variations or too fast changes. So that then if you have a planet which wobbles a lot around, which mm. mass is, uh, which right. the axis is swinging like this a lot, uh, much stronger than Milankovitch cycle on Earth. So that changes uh, climate conditions much more rapid than what, well, uh, us so will we, survive. We can tell um, evolution around the star, but not rotation on the axis at this point. No, the, again, all models, yeah. all yeah. models. So the, the the objects which are very close, they are actually locked into a, what is it? Um, in the, uh, totally locked, yes. So so it shows all the time the same face, a little more strong than uh, Venus or Mercury. So it is uh, challenging to produce there also some environment. So maybe there's, there's the theory that it is just at the, um, at the where night and day connects and jump in between. <laughs> but okay, I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of aspects which are investigated and proven probably never. But okay, great. I'd like to thank you again very much for coming and for helping us today. Please join us at the um page. If you would like to turn it for drinks and for more socializing and asking some more questions and talking to each other, I think it's really great that we have a, a fairly diverse table. <laughs>
Thank you all for coming today. It's been a really great session. And we'll see you again on Thursday. All the geology is everything all together. I think we just love having it.